Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Open Space Board of Trustees meeting of March 9th, uh, 2022. It's a beautiful snowy evening here in Boulder, Colorado, and we are fortunately gathered along with the Open Space and Mountains Park staff uh, in the Board of Trustees to conduct the business of the City of Boulder. Um, we have uh, an engaging agenda uh, for the public this evening. Um, we will be hosting um, in approximately five minutes a public comment period, as we always do at the beginning of our meeting. And we also do have a public hearing item, item number three, um, on our agenda. Um, essentially, during that period, the staff will introduce the item. Um, there'll be a period of clarifying questions, and then we will have a public comment period. So I just want to paint the picture of the opportunities for public involvement so people can start to think about if they have things to say. Um, and with that said, I'd like to turn the meeting over um, to Allison, who is going to cover the rules of Boulder uh, meetings. Sure. Thanks, Hal. Thank you for joining this evening in order to strike a balance between transparent engagement and online safety. The following rules will be applied to tonight's meeting. This meeting has been called to conduct the business of the City of Boulder. Activities that disrupt, delay, or interfere with the meeting are prohibited. The time for speaking or asking questions may be limited and no person shall speak except when recognized by the person presiding and no person shall speak for longer than the time allotted. Each person shall register to speak at the meeting using that person's real name. So if you've joined by uh, phone or by iPad, we would ask that you enter your name instead or you can uh, message me in the chat and I can rename you. No video will be permitted except for city officials, employees, and invited speakers and presenters. All others will participate by voice only. The person presiding at the meeting shall enforce these rules by muting anyone who violates any rule. The chat function is enabled to host only and it is for technical Zoom related questions only. Only the host and individuals designated by the host will be permitted to share their screen during this meeting. And when we get to public comment or public hearing, you can raise your hand if you wish to speak and you can open the participants icon probably along the bottom of your screen and click those three little dots in the bottom right hand corner of the participants box to find the raise hand feature or it's sometimes also under the reactions icon. If you're joining by phone, you can raise your hand um, by pressing star nine. Thank you, Allison. Um, with that, we start the administrative portion of the evening and that is calling the roll first of uh, the Board of Trustees. Do we have Michelle Estrella? Here. We have Caroline Miller. Present. We have Dave Koontz. Here. We have Karen Holwood. Here. And I, Hal Holstein, am also present. Um, with that, we are ready to begin the meeting, and I would ask everyone to please turn their attention to the minutes of our prior meeting of February 9th, 2022. That is page three of the PDF packet. As is customary, we usually go page by page um, to see what issues are here. Does anyone have any issues they'd like to raise on page one? Great, seeing none, we move to page two. Does anyone have any issues on page two? Fantastic. Um, we have minutes uh, with no issues among the board. Does anyone um, care to lift a motion to approve the minutes? I, uh, I so move. I second. We have Caroline uh, moving and Dave seconding, and I will call the roll. Uh, Michelle Estrella. Yes. Uh, Caroline Miller, yes, you approve. Um, Dave, Karen Holwood. Yes. And I myself approve, and so that is unanimous business. Um, with that uh, so briefly done, I think that's the fastest uh, I've ever seen that happen. This is fantastic. Um, we are going to uh, accept uh, raised hands, or perhaps we have a pre-existing list for the public comment period. 
Um, due to how fast we're moving, I suggest we offer three minutes uh, this evening. We didn't have anyone signed up in advance to speak. Okay. And I see no raised hands, so perhaps the wind is at our back tonight. Oh, oh we got one. Okay. Let me just set up the timer and then Lynn, you'll be up in one. Give me one second. Okay, Lynn, you should be able to unmute. Oops, let me start you over. Can you unmute now, Lynn? Good evening, Lynn. Which one do you want me to unmute? Okay, sorry. All right, so let me start. Put up the blue one and I try to do it and then it cancels each other. Oh, sorry. Okay, go ahead, Lynn. Yeah, I'm okay. Um, yeah, um, I, I like to be last because I like to hear what other people have to say. That's why I take to the last minute to speak. And as you know, I always speak. Anyway, um, and I spoke lately in the Capitol at Denver um, in opposition to small nucle nuclear reactors. And guess what I got? a video window. Can you believe it? I got a frigging video window. I kid you not. At the state. Why don't I have a frigging video window with OSBT? I know you can't respond back, right? I mean, I'd love an interaction here, but it's been two years I've been asking. No word from anybody. Lynn, I think we should, uh, you should take that up with city council. Um, th some of the rules yeah. related to the meeting have been uh, sent to us from, from on high. Yeah, I have. And see, it's not working. It needs to be kicked up. You know, that's the deal. Just like you, Hal. Losing your seat last night was traumatic for me. Um, and, and your legacy is going to be that we are going to have a vote on this land disposal at CU South. This is so destructive to our community to have this excessive growth that Berkeley itself capped enrollment on their campus before a Georgia-based student housing developer came here to do the millennium, to do a whole hotel row. Boulder's no longer getting any sales tax revenue from hotels anymore because we convert the hotels to student housing. Who owns this town? Who owns it? This land disposal has to be put before the voters. It's Boulder's last chance. Too much of a good thing. It's just so sad and so pointless that every planning board meeting I go to, every development that comes up, they're giving away open space. You know, the, the requirement of open space, they're giving it away for density. And why the density? To accommodate 35,000 students in a town of 100,000 people. This is so outrageous. And somebody's got to do something to stop it. We are in deficit, 300 million, whatever. Lynn, thank yeah. you very much for your comments this evening. Um, we, we appreciate hearing from you and you coming to our meetings so regularly. The appreciation is reversed. OK. Um, with that, Dan, I would like to hand um, the evening over for you. I'm very glad I do not need to read uh, the next item. Uh, so I'm going to let you handle how we're going to introduce all of this. Well, Hal, I do not have it memorized. <laughs> and I will not read it, uh, exactly. I'll leave that up to Bethany to determine how she wants to go through it. But I'll just uh, 
Um, so we're going to, uh, staff presented uh, materials last month uh, on this particular transaction we're going to go over tonight. Um, it's a transaction that's been in, uh, in the works and in negotiation for about three plus years. High level, it's going to result in a net increase in protected land uh, that will be overseen by OSMP. Uh, there'll be a net increase in land to the Western Mountain Parks um, uh, Habitat Conservation Area. Uh, there'll be an updated and restated and enhanced conservation easement agreement. There'll be new wildlife friendly fencing around the property boundary. And most importantly, uh, this transaction will resolve and rectify legal discrepancies and survey discrepancies that have been occurring over the years that have led to uh, uh, some of the issues and problems that will be summarized tonight. So to kind of help us bring us through all of this, uh, I will introduce uh, Bethany Collins, uh, Senior Manager of our Real Estate Services uh, uh, Program Area. Thanks, Dan. Uh, good introduction of a, of a complicated undertaking. Um, can everybody see the slide presentation? All right, small victories already. <laughs> um, uh, good evening, trustees. I'm here again tonight uh, for a short presentation and then have time for questions and discussion. With this agenda item, staff is recommending three motions that are all tied to combined acquisition and land exchange transaction. Uh, I'll go through the components of the individual motions in hopes of helping you visualize and understand the elements of the proposed transaction, which is the culmination of about three years of negotiations between OSMP staff and the landowners and our respective attorneys. And we'll also resolve the described boundary and encroachment issues and allow even better stewardship of the open space land interest. For background and to get your bearings, the properties we're discussing tonight are located at the far west end of Arapahoe Avenue, adjacent to the Viewpoint Trail. I think we've been here before pretty recently <laughs> together. Uh, the Sterrick South Conservation Easement encumbers the approximately 2.88 acre property located at 308 Arapahoe Avenue and is owned by Arapahoe West LLC. It's located in area three of the BVCP and is zoned forestry. It's surrounded by the city-owned Gabrell, Valentine, and Sterrick open space properties. The Sterrick South CE protects private property for open space and residential purposes, and the site includes a single family residence, garage, an office unit, and other improvements in landscaping. The Gabrell property and a portion of the Valentine property are located within the Western Mountain Park Habitat Conservation Area. As detailed in the memo, in 2018, Arapaho West LLC submitted a retroactive site plan review application to Boulder County. This application was for grading work the owners undertook on the Sterrick South CE to perform landscape, flood mitigation, and drainage work to address damages from the 2013 flood, prevent additional erosion, and make other improvements to the residential property. During review of the historic development plans and surveys and th through conversations with Arapahoe West and Boulder County staff, several survey and boundary ah, excuse me, discrepancies were identified. In addition, city and county staff and, prop and the property owner discovered that some of the grading work and improvements extended onto adjacent mapped city owned open space property. These boundary and site development issues extend back to at least the 1980s prior to the current ownership of these properties by the city and Arapaho West. All right, here we go. <laughs> the first motion relates to a proposed land exchange of 0 0.24 acres and subsequent amended and restated conservation easement pursuant to the disposal procedures of Article 12, Section 177 of the Boulder City Charter. Staff is recommending conveying 0 0.24 acres of land seen here in green from the Valentine and Sterrick open space properties to Arapaho West LLC in exchange for 0 0.024 acres of land seen here in yellow from Arapaho West Sterrick South conservation easement property. The city-owned land identified for disposal to Arapahoe West is impacted by residential and landscaping activities and infrastructure. 
The Southeast parcel will be removed from the HBA and all three parcels will be included in and restricted under the amended and restated Steric South conservation easement. The encroachments identified on these parcels are due in large part to the reliance on inaccurate fence lines, discrepant surveys and problematic legal descriptions, which allowed for development of erroneous site plans and construction of improvements and placement of landscaping over the years. In researching the various errors and finding that the boundary problems stem at least partly from a 1985 subdivision and boundary line adjustment of, <clears throat> excuse me, of the Steric South CE, Gabrell and Valentine parcels, OSMP and CAO staff are recommending the three small parcels for disposal in a land exchange rather than removal from, of the improvements and restoration due to the history of city and county approvals of the structures and activities and mutual support for modest setbacks between the residential activities and open space lands. The area of private property identified for city ownership is not impacted or improved and includes high value forest foothill habitat. Under the current conservation easement, there are few restrictions on the potential impacts or uses that could occur in this area. But with the city's acquisition, the parcel will be removed from the Steric South CE and added to the Western Mountain Parks HCA. Moving on to the second motion, staff is seeking a recommendation to acquire approximately 0.21 acres of land shown here in purple that has been identified as an area of questionable title. The legal descriptions created during the 1985 subdivision of the parcels have call distances that when calculated by surveyors based on the identified points of beginning, point of beginning, leave an almost 20 foot wide strip of questionable title. As part of this proposed transaction, Arapahoe West will agree to a quick claim all rights they may have in, in the strip of land to the city, which avoids litigation related to ownership or a quiet title action. The parcel also includes high value forest foothill habitat and will be added to the habitat conservation area. And coming to the third motion, staff seeks a board recommendation to council related to the addition and removal of the identified parcels to and from the Western Mountain Parks Habitat Conservation Area. An ordinance change is necessary, is a necessary part of this transaction to add and remove the exchange excuse me, parcels from the HCA, because HCAs are designated by ordinance after the city manager identifies and proposes areas for restricted public use based on criteria from the OSMP visitor master plan. Therefore, any change to the boundaries of an HCA must be made by amending the ordinance that initially designated the HCA. Since the approximately 0.45 acres to be acquired in this transaction includes similar natural reefs as the adjacent lands within the HCA, Staff recommends it be added to the Western Mountain Parks HCA and similarly restricted. Additionally, approximately 0.05 acres of land proposed to be disposed to Arapahoe West lies within the HCA and is recommended for approval since it will be in private ownership. The proposed land exchange acquisition and changes to the Western Mountain Parks Habitat Conservation Area are all conditioned on Boulder County's approval of associated boundary line adjustments, which will be pursued in cooperation with Arapahoe West and ultimately provide accurate property deeds and supporting survey. With the land exchange and boundary line adjustments approved, an amended and restated Steric South conservation easement will be executed to update the legal description and identify the additional important conservation values of the property. This updated CE is seen by staff as a huge benefit since among other updated terms, it will be more restrictive on the uses and development of the property and clarify right of entry for monitoring and enforcement. The landowners have also agreed to fence the new property lines, which will establish and better identify the property, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the boundary and prevent encroachments and potential trespass into the HCA. This proposed transaction would further OSMP master plan strategies and charter purposes by extinguishing, <clears throat> excuse me, <laughs> um, this, this proposed transaction would further OSMP master plan strategies and charter purposes by and allow for better 
natural and scenic resource protection and enhancements to these open space lands. As mentioned previously, the staff recommendation is made after years of analysis, review, and negotiations with Arapahoe West LLC, and with legal support and careful consideration of the alternatives, which include carrying out the transaction as proposed, which will avoid litigation and result in a net gain of protected open space for the city, including valuable habitat added to the HCA, as well as res resolution of the boundary and encroachment issues, an updated and more robust conservation easement, and fencing to identify the property lines and the HCA boundaries. Legal action, another alternative was legal action to quiet title, the area of questionable title, and resolve the identified encroachments, which could result in a far less favorable outcome than the negotiated transaction, would be lengthy and costly, in addition to the significant time and resources that have already gone into negotiating with the landowner in lieu of litigation, and would very likely not include a more robust amended conservation easement, boundary fencing, or a net gain in protected open space to the city. And finally, an alternative status quo or the do nothing alternative, which of course would leave, leave the boundary and encroachment issues unresolved with no clarity related to future development of the residential property. And there would be no updated conservation easement, which currently isn't very restrictive or protective of the conservation values and is difficult to monitor and enforce and there would be no boundary fencing. Additionally, Arapahoe West or a future owner could pursue quiet title of the area of questionable title or possibly other legal action that would still force the city into lengthy and costly litigation. And that brings us to the staff recommendation and any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Bethany. I am certain we will have some questions <laughs> on this. Um, so I'd like to open it up to the board uh, for those who have some. Yeah, just some clarifying questions, I guess. Um, Bethany, what is quiet title? Um, quiet title is an action you take if you identify property and you cannot figure out exactly, there's, there's either a cloud on title, which means certain encumbrances or, or title didn't pass from landowner to landowner correctly, or in this case where there's a, a insufficient legal description that leads, uh, leads to, to questionable who, who has the actual fee title interest in the property. Um, so you have to go through a very public and, and very legal process to, to make a claim to that, that um, uh, area, that legal description or that area, and, and um, basically make your case and pursue legal action to, to, to acquire it and see um, through a judicial process. And do you have a map uh, that has like all of the proposed actions all in one? Or I do, yeah, yeah. That um, I, I believe is a attachment. Oh, I'm going to get it wrong. D, perhaps on your in your packet, but I can also let me bring it up and share my screen again. I think yeah, it is D. At, yep, it is D. D. <laughs> I have them memorized. Yeah, I think it's page twenty-three. Twenty-three. Okay. Under item, I was looking at 49, but it's It's the very colorful one. Hang on. <laughs> uh, I mean, I mean, I'd, like to, I'd like to follow up on Michelle's question on the questionable title section. Yes. So <laughs> um, in getting a quick claim deed, it, it, when you use the word acquisition, you know, kind of my ears perk up. Um, is there any open space mountain parks funds that are associated with a, a quit claim deed or in this particular situation? No, there will be no funding changing hands for that that uh, area of, uh, of questionable title that will be quit claim to us. Okay, great, thanks. Which it, uh, hopefully you can see my screen now um, is about 0.21 acres, yeah. Right. The purple, the purple area. Right, thanks. Sure. I have another question is, as long as I've got the floor. Um, given the three years or so that this has been kind of under review and negotiations, ha have we had any conversations with Boulder County on uh, what we can expect their review to consist of? And if so, have we addressed whatever uh, issues or questions they might have? Um, so far, we have reached out um, and uh, determined that we do have to go through the subdivision exemption process, which is what you have to go through to, to, to alter boundary lines. Um, they haven't seen any issue with 
uh, what we're proposing here um, at, at its surface. We have not gone through a full pre-app, however, um, but have presented kind of the issues and, and identified the, the problems and the legal description issues we'll have to go through. So the preliminary conversations uh, have been pretty straightforward. Yes. Great, thanks. Sure. Um, on the map that you're showing right now, uh, Bethany, there was in the text a uh, statement about restoration that was done. Can you just show us with your cursor on that map where the restoration was? Uh, what do you mean in the text? In what, in my narrative or in? In the material that I read in the packet. Oh, oh, yes, I'm sorry. Um, so some of the encroachments um, that, that were discovered after this, oh, during this grading permit were um, some, some drainage improvements where they put some step pools to slow drainage. And those came off the property and, and into this area. Um, and those, are, uh, those have been restored and um, they are uh, also under warranty for the revegetation and the weed control that will occur. Um, and there was also um, some, which you uh, can actually see in this aerial. Oh, I'm sorry. You guys aren't seeing this because I don't have my, um, Hang on, I can do it again. Not, I have no idea what you. What I you're know. Doing. I'm sorry. I thought I turned my laser pointer on. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay. So in this in this drainage up and off of this property, there were some step pools created um, that have been restored, and again um, are going through weed control and reseeding um, that that do carry warranties with the landowner. They did they did some restoration there. Um, there were also um, some. Uh, some carvings, actually you can see one going off. You can't see it in this. Um, there were some, actually here they are. So down into this area, there were some um, uh, carvings that they made um, and I I'm gonna get the, the name wrong actually, um, but to try to flow water down the slope as part of the um, flood mitigation they were doing on the property and they, they entered what it is, you know, what has now been mapped and clarified as open space. And so as well as the, as those as well have been um, ripped, reseeded and uh, undergoing weed control under supervision by the city, by uh, our, our uh, um, restoration ecologist, excuse me. Okay, and then also on this map, can you show me where the gazebo is and where the swimming pool is? Um, sure, the swimming pool is over here. The gazebo was not constructed, so it was actually traded out in a in an easement exchange. I mean, in an easement amendment for a greenhouse that is going to be going in this area. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, just, I, I have a couple clarifying questions. One on the purple section. Um, I'm, I'm struggling to see where the green proposed property boundary is on that longest side of the property. Can you just show where the proposed boundary falls? So uh, the, proposed, the proposed new boundary will basically follow this green line of the, of the private property I'm outlining it now, then the orange all the way around to this green and the green on the outside here and then the green slash orange and the green here. Does that make sense? Okay, so, so the area of questionable title, mm -hmm. it, it's, it, it's quieted to who, forgive me? So it will be quieted to the city. So why, a, oh, okay, uh, the, I, all right, forgive me, I'm dense, that makes perfect sense. No, you're good, me. yeah. So Arapaho West will give up any right title and interest they have in that purple strip. They will also be conveying to the city this yellow strip. And so that will create that new 0.45 acres that will be added to the HCA and to city ownership. Great, and my second clarifying question was, um, Dan, related to the brief memo sent by email um, related to how the license and disposal document uh, touches on conservation easements, I'm wondering in consideration of, uh, I guess let's call it motion one, in sentence two, we're using the word removing approximately 0.24 acres of land from the Steric South conservation easement. Is the selection of the word removing intentional or non-intentional? 
It is, uh, Dan, I can jump in. Um, it is intentional. So it is removing from the legal description of the current conservation easement 0.24 acres because we will be removing um, basically by merger, but we will, we are agreeing to, to remove this portion, the yellow, yellowish, yellow greenish portion is currently in the conservation easement. So that will be removed by virtue of conveying title, fee title to the city. Um, and so by doing that, we included the amended and restated conservation easement in the disposal provisions because it is disposing of uh, open space interest by basically giving that interest to the city. <laughs> and, 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 and I guess that's the question. Why use the word remove as, a, as a opposed to dispose? Oh, um, we can we can certainly change. We can alter that. That's fine. That's absolutely fine in the in the memo language. Okay, maybe we'll look at that. Yeah. Just, I just we'll clarifying Certainly. myself. Yep. Okay. Other clarifying questions. Um, I have one. After we're done here tonight, you said that then you will um, meet and and partner with Boulder County. Is that correct? Um, so after tonight, we have to go to city council for approval of all, any, any of your recommendations and approvals. Um, and at that point, then, yes, we will do a pre-application for a subdivision exemption um, to alter the boundaries that you're seeing to make it the orange and green boundaries, basically, um, <laughs> or the, the light green line. And then we will, um, to, to, and, and if that's approved, then we will execute the deeds that are identified here, as well as the amended re and restated conservation easements. So we have to get all of those various uh, approvals before we can we can undertake the actual action, I guess you could say. Um, so within those steps, if something changes with the, the property lines as we are being shown now, will this be brought back to us and, yes. and considered, um, you know, basically a redo, I guess, is word that comes to mind yes it would have to if it changes if it alters from this proposed scenario it would need to come back to you yep okay thank you sure Bethany, why again does the 0.05 acres that little pie wedge off to the right and i'm colorblind so i can't point yeah there we go yep why does that have to get removed from the HCA? I know you said because it's going to go, it's going to, the ownership is going to go to Arapaho. Is something else happening within the rectangle? I mean, and I know it's like. Oh, yeah. in this rectangle? No, yeah. those are just, those are just measurements, Michelle. They were, they were providing the, the measurements from, you know, of, in order to provide the acreage. So the blue is just simply. Uh, to provide kind of square footage and acreage. I know that it's a, it's a busy map, but no, nothing else is help, happening in the rectangle. It's just this, this kind of curvy wedge that would be um, uh, put into the private property, into the conservation easement, but because it will be private, it will be removed from the HD. Maybe one more for me. Um, it strikes me that uh, there'll be, th this is a, a, an exceptional pro project for a survey professional. Um, can you, has there been a fair cost sharing associated with survey costs on this? Um, there is not. The uh, Arepa West LLC is paying all survey costs associated with this. Tremendous. Yes. <laughs> and they'll be paying for the fencing as well. Somewhere I made a note that there was an ordinance 7459 referred to. Do you happen to know what that is? Um, I believe 7459 is the amendment to the original HCA ordinance um, that that designated the Western Mountain that that created the Western Mountain Parks HCA. 70 the the one you just identified added um, more properties to the to the HCA. Okay, thanks. Certainly. I hear pencils moving. Any any <laughs> other questions? Okay, seeing no more clarifying questions, um, I think I will hand this over to Allison um, to lead us through the public hearing portion of uh, the item. 
Not seen any hands yet. To members of the public, uh, anyone who has come to speak on this issue, now's the time. Okay, Lynn. Okay, and we're going to be going with two minutes on this topic. Okay, can you unmute your unmute Lynn? I'm unmuted. Okay, go ahead. I should have waited because there's a bunch of people now. Um, but it's it sounds good to me, um, especially um, considering that it can avoid any um, lawyers involved in the litigation. Um, so I think I'm supportive of what's going on here. Um, I think I know Steric. If I knew his first name, I'd know if I know the guy. I'm pretty sure I know him. His name was something like Steve. And it was like over a decade or 15 years ago that I knew him. I think I know the same person. Anyway, um, and it sounds like they're putting up the fence. They're, they're, the drainage, like at the bottom, I hope that, that the city is not put out too much monetarily from the drainage issue from one property to the other. But um, I always appreciate our ability to get these HCAs or whatever it's called, habitation, ha habitat conservation areas. Yeah, HCAs. Um, and that we can benefit from folks that you know are willing to offer them. So I think it's great. I also didn't finish my sentence with the first comment that I had about the Georgia um, student housing company that is doing the millennium. They also did a lot of work in Berkeley that actually elicited Berkeley to cap their enrollment. So it's like now they're coming to Boulder to have their way with us. So I hope that can be avoided. And I hope that also the millennium can be preserved rather than demoed. Thank, Thank you, Lynn. Appreciate that. Okay, um, I see no more hands. Um, do you, Allison? Nope. Okay, seeing no more hands, um, I guess we will return to the board for um, deliberation. And if someone can, well, can we get a, a packet page number for the series of recommendations and items? Is that, I'm, I'm clicking through, oh, there it is, right, right up, page number one, there it is. <laughs> We started this off, is everybody seeing that as page uh, five of the PDF packet? Karen. I have a few questions on the, the provisions in the conservation easement itself. Is now the time to ask those? I think so. Um, on page, I'm referring to the PDF copy pages page 28, uh, it's paragraph 3.5. Um, it talks about livestock that will be allowed, sheep, sheep or goats, chickens, etc. cetera. Um, I didn't read anything that required them to be contained as opposed to free ranging. Uh, could something be, be added so that it's clear that they have to be kept in an enclosed area on the property? Um, I can check on that, Karen. Um, again, there will be a, li a, a wildlife friendly livestock fence on the, on the uh, surrounding the property. Um, and I believe county code and forestry would require them to be contained, but I, I'll, I will double check on that, yes. Because I'd like to avoid having chickens and goats on the habitat conservation area land. Yes, absolutely. Um, then uh, on page 30, uh, at the bottom of the page is paragraph 3.16. And on page... The 
other page that I sent an email to you on, there's another pa paragraph that duplicates that. Yeah, you had mentioned 3.16 and 3.23, which are on pages ooh, uh, 30 and 31. Right. That are, yeah, they have some redundancy to them. And so we, uh, I've already mentioned that to the city attorney of, of combining them. Good, okay. Um, and then my other question is on page 33 at the top of the page, paragraph 3.28. It uh, talks about use of motorized vehicles. Um, it has to be limited to roads or trails existing as of the date of the easement. Um, but it doesn't say anything about drones. And I'm wondering if drones can be added to this list of mechanized. Um, that's a great question. I don't know that I've ever seen uh, drone use on a, on a private property or a conservation easement restricted. Now, of course, um, they can't they can't fly from the open space. So is your concern flying them on their own on the their own property? On the private property? Um, it's more the impact on the surrounding habitat conservation. Okay. Okay. That's a that's a great question. That one I, I'm unsure of, but I, I will double check. I don't know that they would have an issue with that, but I I, I also can't speak, you know, for the, the overall negotiation, but um it seems like a minor ask. So I will I will ask about adding that, Karen. Thank you. Certainly. Yeah, I'll, I'll just mention I appreciate that, Karen. Um, as we evolve our, our easement language, innovations are simultaneously happening. So th those are some interesting thoughts. Absolutely. As soon as you as soon as you finalize them, you figure out more <laughs> more stuff that 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 didn't get included. So. Um. For our deliberation, I, I have one item. Um, I am, I'm not positive about it, but I would love other board members' feedback. In the actual language of the uh, motions for consideration, um, there are two instances of the word removal that um, I'd either like to be convinced are appropriate or otherwise exchange with the word disposal for consistency and clarity. And, and frankly, Dan, to my conceptual framework and understanding of your memo and in what we're doing. So I'm, I'm open to staff comments, board comments. Yeah, I would definitely support removing, I mean, <laughs> removing removal, uh, changing it to disposal in paragraph one. If you're talking about removal in, uh, I mean, in motion one, if you're talking about removal in motion three, I think we need to, um, to keep it because it's it's a designation rather than a conveyance and so it would be removing the designation from uh, removing it from the, having the hda designation um rather than disposing of it under kind of 177 of the charter does that make sense so it remains under osmp jurisdiction so to speak it's uh it just loses its designation in the brc well it, it goes to private so so we're handling the disposal of that portion of land in motion number one, and then we're removing the designation of it as being in the HCA in paragraph three, in motion three. I'm seeing nodding heads. Everybody else finds that convincing. Great. <laughs> so clear, right? <laughs> uh, Bethany, why couldn't we uh, to uh, deal with Hal's question, why couldn't we say removal of the designation of a portion of the property so that it is sure. very clear sure. that that's what's being removed, not the, not the property itself. Yeah, removal of the designation from the portion of the property. Yep, right. that, that could totally work. Um, the HCA designation, right? Yeah. Yep. I'm wondering if Leah might want to pull up the uh, motions that were in the packet to start capturing some of this. Yeah, since we're making a few changes, let's let's uh, see if we can't track. Thank you.
while that's coming up, uh, or is, is it up and I'm not seeing it? Yeah, Leah, do you have um, that second point within removal of the designation? Is that how, or Dave, you want to repeat your language there? Your uh, yeah, that's correct. Removal of the designation of the portion of property, I, I would say uh, within the uh, Western Mountain Parks Habitat Conservation Area. The portion of the property from... within, so rather than no, after the comma, right. the comma. And is it removal of the HCA designation? Mm -hmm. Yes. Do we still need that comma there? Yeah, I think you got to get rid of the comma. Uh, after from Leah. I'm wondering, should we should we just bring the Western Mountain Parks HCA name up to where the acronym now is just because it's unusual to do an acronym and then the full name? Does that make sense? To anybody? You're gonna get it perfect. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> Um, the That's good. You can leave it in there twice. I mean, or put HCA there in the second instance. Yep. Whichever anyone prefers. Yeah, change that to HCA. Okay. Uh, then we would have to describe HCA if it hasn't been already. So under the full, yep, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Good. Perfect. Sounds well, like people ready for a motion. Yeah. Well. Well. Quickly, just before we go there, um, two two quick things for me. One is kind of a conceptual question, Bethany. Um, it's clear that this is overall, and uh, I should say, overarching, a simplification transaction. Um, and that's tell me if I'm wrong, but that simplification will be visible in uh, Boulder County parcel mapping will be reflected on maps, yet the pile of legal paperwork underlying the parcel docket will grow twice as thick again. Just, just offer your comments a little bit on your philosophy on true simplification in these maps. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing we do is easy. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's easy anymore. All the easy stuff is done. Yeah, so I mean, as you've seen over the last several months, so much of what we're we're seeing now is about is about stewardship, right? It's not about acquiring a, a whole bunch more land. It's now um, correcting and finessing and and dealing with um, you know clarifying management and you know resolving encroachments and things like that. And those things take a ton of paperwork. <laughs> so um, yeah, so the the. You know, these are these are small what what is considered small parcels, but um, in order to do any of this stuff, you need you need a lot of the documentation, and and I would say to some degree it it might benefit us because apparently when they did they did the subdivision in 1985 they got it wrong with 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 less documentation right and so we you know it takes more documentation I guess to get things right. Okay, and that just leads to my next question. I think in uh, generally speaking, I'll be lending my support to this concept, but I am wondering if in this area and on this road, there are any other areas that you have identified as potential places where private owners might confuse our land for theirs. And if we've taken appropriate steps to block such incursion pre preemptively to avoid similar sticky wickets. Um, so far, no, we have not found that. And we have, as part of this, done significant amounts of research to the, the access road, as well as the others, their conservation easement, the stairs property, and then um, the private properties at, at 306 and, and down the street. Um, and then, as you know, we've, we've dealt very recently with the adjacent Kessler property and some of the, and resolving some of the issues down there. And so um, we haven't, uh, again, there's been a a whole lot of eyes on the many, many documents in this area, and we haven't found additional. But that's not to say, you know, something something doesn't come forward. These are some of these are old, 
our, our properties with old and, and com, you know, some, some messy deeds. A lot of this area was, uh, was, was originally mining claims. And so that's one of the things that makes it a bit messier. Thank you. Sure. Any other um, comments or thoughts from board members? Hal, yeah, I, I hate to be a pain in the butt, but I think we, we still need to work on the language of the motion. Uh, so let me read it and see if I'm either misinterpreting it or we, we need to work, clear it up. So the motion to recommend that city council adopt an ordinance ordering the designation of an additional portion of property to, I would say we need to put to the Western Mountain Parks Habitat Conservation Area and, and, and then and removal of the uh, Western Mountain Parks HCA designation of the portion of the property. Um, because after the two, there is a comma and it just kind of dangles. It, and so I think we got to say what we're at ordering the designation of or to. So it's uh, to the Western Mountain Parks Habitat Conservation Area, comma, and removal of the Western Mountain Parks Conservation Area designation of the portion of the property within I'll, the HCA pursuant to blah, blah, blah. I'm convinced. Others? Yeah, this one's obviously a little tricky. So the, the more specific the language, the better it will be read in the future if it, if it ever needs to be. Hopefully not in our time. Dave, you might have to help me with, I switched it a little bit. Will you read that and then correct okay. what I said? So a motion to recommend that city council adopt an ordinance ordering the designation of an additional portion of the property to, of the property to the Western Mountain Parks Habitat Conservation Area comma, and removal of the HCA designation of the portion of the property from within the HCA pursuant to, you know, BRC. So I think you're okay. Uh, only question, uh, the word portion before the cursor, the word the, I believe, should be an A. Is that correct? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, especially, yeah, uh, I was thinking there would be a map, but yeah, if there's no map, then you're right. And there is a map that goes along with it. And I believe it's, it's part of the, the draft ordinance in your packet. Well, there are no references to the maps in the proposed motion language. Uh, again, Karen, this is just recommending the change, the uh, adopt an ordinance, and so the ordinance will have the the map. The ordinance that will be before City Council will have the map, if that's helpful. As opposed to the motion. Okay. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. Karen, as an aside, if you wouldn't mind, uh, I'm hard of hearing and I can't hear you very well. Can you turn up your microphone or talk closer to it or something? Yeah, it sounds a little further away um, than usual for me too, Karen. And you're on mute right now. I don't think I am. I, I hear you well. Okay, well, um, I, I feel like we're perhaps close uh, to somebody ready. To, uh, is somebody ready to lift a motion on this? And read it all. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Um, I move to approve and recommend that City Council approve a land exchange transaction disposing of approximately 0 0.24 acres of land from the Starrick South Conservation Easement property at 308 Arapahoe Avenue, Boulder 80302 to be owned in fee and managed by the City of Boulder for open space purposes and conveying approximately 0 0.24 acres of land from the City owned Valentine Stark open space properties to be owned in fee by Arapaho West LLC and added to the Stark South conservation easement property by an amended and restated conservation easement pursuant to article 12 section 177 of the Boulder City Charter 
And if a petition for referendum meeting charter requirements is not filed within 60 days of council action, motion to recommend city council approve the acquisition of approximately 0.21 acres of land from Arapaho West LLC as depicted on attachment E. And if both the disposal of land and the acquisition of land as so moved are approved by council and a petition for referendum meeting charter requirements is not filed within 60 days of council action. Motion to recommend that city council adopt an ordinance ordering the designation of an additional portion of the property to the Western Mountain Parks Habitat Conservation Area and removal of the HCA designation of a portion of the property from within the HCA pursuant to section 882 BRC, conditioned on the approval of the aforementioned land exchange transaction and acquisition, all of which are conditioned on Boulder County's approval of associated boundary line adjustments. Nice job. Second. We have a uh, second from Karen. And with that, I'll call the roll. Michelle Estrella. Yes. Dave Kuntz. Yes. And I myself also approve. And so we have a unanimous uh, series of recommendations. Bethany, thank you very much for your time. Um, just pursuant to the discussion with Dan about the words removal and how that pertains to designation. Um, just given all the work we put in on the license and disposal document together, hopefully we can kind of carry that forward and um, just, yeah, keep that all aligned. Thank you so much, uh, everybody who worked on this. That one looks like a heavy lift. Mm. Great. Um, that brings us back to, I'm heading up in the agenda here. Um, matters from the department. So um, Dan, please take it away. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you, Hal. Just uh, hats off to Bethany and uh, Janet Michaels and some of our legal team who has spent a lot of hours on that item. So a small one, but it's cer certainly great to get that all cleaned up and clarified. So thanks to staff for that. Um, yeah, so this item ar arose, uh, some of you might recall a conversation we maybe had in late summer, early fall, about wanting to uh, revisit uh, uh, current visitation numbers. And we recommended, well, let's, let's wait for the rest of the year to play out and we'll come forward and, and discuss uh, what we're seeing from uh, our 2021 visitation um, um, uh, data. And when we were discussing that, that's what we thought we would do is we would focus in on 2021. But actually over the last few months in talking with staff, uh, uh, mainly uh, some of John's staff over in our human dimensions program area, it became clear that uh, perhaps we should do that as do this, talk about 2021, but to also expand the conversation a bit and, and to um, introduce the board to um, some other information that I think that you are gonna find very interesting and I'm sure it's gonna spark some conversation here tonight. Uh, one of the reasons for expanding the scope and, and going beyond conversations of just simply around 2021 numbers is to really share and introduce with you all uh, more details, more concepts and methods that are associated with our Human Dimensions program and to describe some of the advancements that the HD program has been making in regards to visitation data. Uh, you know, these, these advancements that uh, have been being honed or continually being honed in on and over, over the last few years, they really represent an important step in our commitment to supporting data-driven decision-making by improving the accuracy of the, of the data and the efficiency of our visitation statistics program. So, um, so with that, we're going to present some, maybe some new terminology to you, uh, dive a little bit deeper into methodology than perhaps you were maybe expecting us to tonight. And, uh, and, and basically, because we're improving our data and we're, we're improving the accuracy, uh, some numbers are gonna, going to change uh, eventually on some of the data that we're talking about. And so with all of that, uh, I guess my ask is, uh, is for all of us just to keep an, uh, an open mind because we're going to uh, maybe challenge some of our underlying assumptions that we may, all, may have all had walking into tonight. So I endure, do encourage that open-mindedness as the intention and focus should ultimately be looking at the data 
and how advancements and improvements in data collection allows us the opportunity to understand better in real time what, is, what we're seeing on the ground and at specific areas in our system. And of course, if we have better real-time data, instead of waiting four years, for instance, to get a, a new analysis underway, but we're able to look at things on the spot as data comes in, that in turn is gonna help us better support management decisions. So with that exhaustive high-level introduction, I'm going to introduce and turn things over to Colin Leslie, who's one of our Human Dimensions senior uh, analysts to share and uh, uh, talk about some of this uh, updates to our visitation statistics program, which includes uh, talking about preliminary data about visitations in 2021. So with that, Colin, take it away. Great, thank you, Dan. Um, hello, everybody. Thanks for having me tonight. I'm excited to be able to share some of this stuff out with, with everyone. Get my screen shared here and um, try and uh, make sure to not talk faster. I know there can be sometimes a little bit of a delay in the in the presentation, so I'll try and advance slowly. But uh, great introduction, Dan. Yes, I'm here to talk about our visitation statistics program most definitely including some updates about 2021 visitation data. Um, and also to give you a little bit of a look sort of behind the scenes and how we've been evolving the way that we collect visitation data recently and how it's really setting us up to move forward with visitation. So, So tonight we're going to start off with a bit of an overview about the system, um, really in the context of what does the system look like when we have to think about how we monitor and assess visitation. Then we'll be able to go into a little bit of some of the high level methodological changes that we've been making, what capabilities that's gonna give us and what it means for some of our recent estimates be able to move into some preliminary results from 2021 and then give you a couple of previews of what we're looking at moving forward. And then we have plenty of time for questions and discussions at the end. And at the end, I'll be happy to flip back to any slides. If there's something that people have questions on, there are slide numbers down in the bottom right corner there. So if you see something that piques your interest and you wanna ask a question about it later, you can uh, jot down the slide number there. So a bit of an overview, how do we look at our system in regards to monitoring visitation data? The first layer of course is our designated trailheads and access points. We have about 110 of those uh, distributed across the system. Our access points are the ones that tend to come off neighborhood streets. Trailheads are the ones with parking features. But we know that we have a lot more areas where, and, and points where people can access our trail system. So we've done our own inventories of those to make sure that we have a comprehensive look at everywhere that people can enter and exit OSMP land because we wanna make sure that we are capturing as complete of a picture as we can. The way that we operationalize that, we don't is, is through about 200 data collection points at the moment. And those consist of what we are now referring to as our long-term count sites and our short-term count sites. So for our long-term count sites, we have about 17 of these, that number will be increasing this year and around 179 short-term count sites. That's really what gives us this overlay on the entire system of places where we need to go to install automated equipment in order to collect visitation data. The types of equipment that we use vary a little bit between long-term and short-term count sites. So for our long-term counters, these are a little bit higher end equipment that we use, they're permanent installations they afford us a bit higher accuracy. They can also do a couple of features that others can't. Um, they can do directional travel, so we can set them up on a trail and detect and classify whether 
the detection is inbound or outbound on that trail segment. We also have several that have multimodal options. So that dashed yellow line represents a buried inductive loop under the trail that's able to detect bikes. So we're able to classify pedestrian from bike trips, including direction. These are also the counters that have automatic data transmission. So if anybody's had a chance to see our visitation data portal, which we released early 2020 as sort of part of our initial response to COVID, this is what allows us to have some regular transmission and sort of streamline that process of sharing out that, that raw data as it comes off the counters um, with the public. We can't deploy that level of equipment everywhere though. So for every other location we use, uh, we install short-term counters. These are a little bit less expensive equipment, but they allow us to do temporary installations. We generally target two to three week installations at each, at each of these short-term counts. They do give us hourly data, um, but they're not directional and they're not manual data retrieval. So they don't give us quite the same level of real-time uh, data streams that we get off our long-term trail counters, but they allow us to cover a much broader swath of the system. So as of the end of 2021, we had cover, we've covered about 50% of the locations that we, that we have in our, in our sample frame. So we're a little over 100 locations, and that's sort of what we're dealing with. Um, some of the methods that I'm about to show you have a lot to do with why we're able to make some estimates now before having every single uh, location assessed on our system. Uh, I think, me. If, yeah. If there are 110 trailheads and access points, where are the other locations? They tend to be uh, adjacent to it. So for example, there are uh, trails that go um, along roadways where there are multiple access points, short access points into the trail system that converge. And sometimes the access point isn't identified until being slightly further down the trail. There are also a lot of undesignated or there are undesignated trails that we also account for in our study. So. so I think the, let me jump back. I think the best way to sum up the, the methods that we've used to assess visitation is that it's really been a history of continuous improvement. So open space and mountain parks has a pretty long history of doing visitation assessments. And they've all really relied on the same basic equation because we have a lot of locations that we need to monitor, we do some grouping of annual or long-term counters that we're able to put out for a year or more. And then we need some way of estimating what visitation is like at all of those other locations. And those get combined together to give us a system-wide visitation estimate. And this is how it's been done in the past. Really, the biggest evolution has been in how do we best account or estimate what visitation is like at all these other locations where we don't have the resources to put a counter out there for a full year and simply add up all the, all the counts that we get off of it. So if we take a quick look at the history of system-wide visitation studies on open space, we've had two studies in the past that have included visitation estimates, one in 2004, 2005, and another in 2016, 2017. We're currently in what we're generally referring to our, as our sort of fourth visitation study. That's what's in progress. The second visitation study was only a survey. It didn't include any estimates. And I guess what I wanna draw your attention to is down there at the bottom in the 2004, 2005 estimate, there were trail counters at about 30, 39 annual, uh, 39 locations where we collected data for a full year. But there were no data collected at any of the other locations. They were assigned a visitation class based on uh, staff judgment and the estimate was sort of expanded out from there. 
we recognized that we had a big opportunity or we had an opportunity to make an improvement in the third visitation study. So we did put short-term counters out at all of those other locations. We collected two week counts and we used those to simply estimate whether we thought it was a very low to a very high visitation class. And those went into the model. The, probably the one thing to know about these two is that really to get a visitation estimate, you have to have an assessment of pretty much every location on the system going into that assessment at once. So, and it doesn't give really high resolution or, or as accurate results as we could about all of those other locations. And that was really something we wanted to improve moving forward. So in the last few years, there's been a new method that's come forward that really lowers the error associated with only being able to do a short-term two to three week count at a location. And that's the approach we've been using going forward. So this is sort of where we get our first preview of some updates to numbers here. In our third visitation study, based on the method, which we replicated from 2004, we estimated 6.3 million visits. That actually included a range of 5.5 .5 to about 7 million estimates. Because of the way that we collected data, we're able to go back, retroactively apply this new methodology. And what we see when we do that is that we really get an estimate closer to about 5.5 million for 2016, 2017. And this really hints at the, the most frequent question we get, which is how has visitation changed? on open space and mountain parks. And there's really two parts to that question. There's, or, or two ways we can look at that question. How has visitation changed overall? And how has visitation changed at individual locations? Because we have a lot of them. And what this new method allows us to do is look at both of those with much better resolution than we've had in the past. So, Getting to 2021 uh, preliminary visitation data. What we are seeing currently is that our overall visitation in 2021 was really pretty similar to what we measured in 2017, less than 1% difference. And that's at that overall level. At a site level, that story is a bit different. So at the moment, there's a few different ways we could visualize this. Looking at this, this plot, the main thing is that points that are red and above that dashed line represent sites where visitation has increased. Points that are blue and below the line represent sites where visitation has decreased since we last measured it in 2017. Of the little over 100 sites that we've we've been able to do repeat assessments at so far, about 50 of those were decreasing and 60 of them have been increasing. That puts our overall estimate of change at less than 1%. But I think this also starts to highlight something interesting about many of the locations on our system, which is that three quarters of our locations receive less than 100 average daily visits. Now that's just a number that really has to be considered in the context of each individual site, because 100 visits at one site may not feel particularly busy. 100 visits at another site might feel pretty busy. Um, so it can be really site specific. And we're, see, we're seeing this mix of increase and decrease. For sites that have increased in visitation, the median increase has been about 14 average daily visits, or sorry, 14 daily visits. The median decrease has been right around 13 daily visits. So that's where we're, that's why we're sort of seeing that offset in the overall number, even though different individual locations are uh, showing changes in different directions. So this is a swath of all the locations that we've reassessed so far. We do have higher resolution data and also longer term data for a handful of locations which we have had trail counters at since at least 2005. 
uh, not every year since 2005, but locations where we've been able to do repeat year long assessments. So 2005 are the bars there in purple, uh, 2017 is in green, and then the two shades of blue represent 2020 and 2021. So I think the main thing that we wanna highlight at this time with this graph is that different sites have shown different growth characteristics over time. Over there on the far left is Chautauqua that's seen a pretty significant increase in the last 15 years. Next on that list is Sinitas Valley that has also seen a pretty steady increase in visitation over the last 15 years. But as we start looking to some of the other locations, we can see that there's been increases and decreases over the last 15 years on a year to year basis. You can see across a lot of the sites that the light blue bar in 2020 goes up a bit there and that many of them have started going back, back down a bit from what we measured in 2021. We can, I'm gonna highlight a couple of locations here to show you the data underneath it and what are really some of the things that we're starting to look at more than just total numbers off sites, but what's some of the underlying patterns that we're looking at. And those really come down to looking at the data in terms of daily, seasonal, and annual patterns. So you can see all the lines going up and down there. Each one of those represents a daily count. Um, that's Chautauqua on top and Flatirons Vista on the bottom. You can see a bit of a repeating pattern in there. That's the weekend weekday effect. Uh, Flat Irons Vista has some more winter effects down there uh, early in 2021. We can see a little bit of a seasonal pattern under here that comes out much more clearly if we apply some smoothing procedures to it. And then we can really see what those seasonal patterns start to look like. And this highlights some of the differences that we are starting to see or that have probably always been there, but we're now able to really start seeing among our locations. So if we look at Chautauqua, that seasonal pattern, right, the shape of that curve is pretty similar between 2020 and 2021, but the peak's a little higher in 2021. Flatirons Vista, the shape, as well as both wind peak visitation sort of occurred for Flatirons Vista, between 20 and 21 is a little bit different. We can simplify this one step further to be equivalent to that bar graph that I showed, or showed earlier to really just an average daily visit. If we took every day of the year and just averaged it all out, what are we seeing? And when we look at Chautauqua, we're seeing that between 20 and 21, it went up over a little over 100 average visits a day whereas Flatirons Vista went down about 40. Because we're getting much better uh, site level estimates as well, this is also gonna give us capabilities to look at the data in a better spatial context. So this is just a sampling of some of the preliminary data here that we've collected. Red points are sites where visitation has gone up blue points or sites where visitation has gone down. And we haven't run any formal analyses yet, but there's just some visual evidence of spatial clustering there. And I think it really highlights that visitation changes are site or area specific, but because we have, we're getting much better site level estimates, that's also gonna give us the capability to get better area or region level estimates by essentially drawing a polygon around an area of interest and being able to say something about visitation in that area. So looking forward, um, we've hit a few milestones. We're gonna hit a few more this year. And I think there's a few next steps that you'll be quite interested in. So the big steps are that we got this long-term uh, count system operational beginning of 2020. I know we've had a couple of chances to share some of that data. We added six new locations last year to uh, permanent counters. We're gonna be adding a few more this year, probably looking at a bit of the Flagstaff corridor. There's been some technological updates and we can get 
we can actually get reception up there to be able to transmit the data. We're gonna complete the rest of our short-term counts, which will give us an opportunity to update our visitation or to give a visitation update a little bit later this year, once we have all of our sites sampled. And then we're looking rather than doing this visitation assessment every four to six years, creating a rotating panel design, probably assessing, breaking it into three panels where we're gonna be able to sample randomly sample a third of these locations every year in order to estimate whether system-wide visitation is changing on an annual basis. But it'll also set us up so that anytime we are going to do an action or a plan in any given area, our, we'll have no data will be older than three years. So every data point, every location in there will have an estimate that's been done within the last three years. I think some key takeaways from what we are seeing now is that overall visitation, that single number sets the context, but there's a lot more to understand and look at and track underneath it. Um, there's been some terminology that's been out there. We don't see an evidence that visitation is growing exponentially. Um, it does. It is going up at some locations, but it's not sort of taking that sharp curve up necessarily. Uh, it's increased of what we've assessed, it's increased at 58 locations and decreased at 47. So definitely a mix there. And some of this behind the scenes stuff is really that we've seen the need to sharpen our approach. And when it comes to visitation questions and management, getting the scale and the accuracy right of the estimates we're able to make is going to be pretty important. We've also been evolving our questions about visitation. What are the types of changes that we should be looking for? What scales should we be looking for those at? And the next questions, because we have all this, we're getting this better site level data is what patterns are there among sites and among management areas uh, that we can ask now that we weren't able to ask five or 10 years ago. And the last point is, we have more data now so we can speak more objectively about visitation and a big part of that that we're is in process right now is also developing better tools so that everybody can access these data both internally and externally so that we can have a shared basis for this just threw up a few management applications here that we certainly see for the data um, the better, the more that we're able to provide this data it can help inform outreach and enforcement staff. Can It's already been involved in conversations to start thinking about where we might prioritize uh, infrastructure and certain trail management objectives. It's definitely a key input to future management plans, um, including being able to identify the types of recreational opportunities and settings that we're going for. And it just provides a sort of more comprehensive understanding of other data sets. Um, these are also discussions we've started having. How can we start looking at things like our undesignated trails inventory, surveys, and this visitation data in better context together. So with that, I will uh, wrap it up. I do want to give a big thanks to our two field technicians, Katie and Chelsea, who have been the ones out installing, maintaining and operating all this equipment in the field. And just a reminder that our long-term counter data is available in our visitation data explorer. It's not, uh, it's sort of a raw feed, but it's out there so that people can take a look. So with that, I will wrap it up and happy to open it up for any questions. Thank just a you, really, sorry, Hal, just a super quick one. Um, the Visitation Data Explorer um, that's available now, how long have we had that um, up and running? We launched the first version of that. Gosh, it used to be on my timeline there. It was, it was between March and April of 2020. That's right, Colin, yeah. 
Okay, I'll, I'll let um, Hal take it back. I just didn't want to lose that one because we were right there. <laughs> no, no, I was just going to say thank you, Colin, and, and look for questions. I, I found this all very fascinating, Colin. Thank you for this presentation. What's um, surprising to me is to see the growth in Chautauqua visitation despite, and I, I don't know if you could go back to that particular graph, despite the implementation of parking fees of like, I think it's 250 an hour during Memorial Day to Labor Day. So, and you have the seasonal version of that? Uh, we do, yeah. Yeah, so the seasonal version of that, you know, when those parking um, fees are actually in effect, um, it's just surprising to me that that didn't really, Im I mean, it, it increased nonetheless, which kind of tells me that the parking fees don't really, um, and the, the shuttle buses don't really impact visitation as much as we thought it was going to. I was on the Chautauqua board at that time. Do you, do you know, Michelle, how many um, parking spaces are in the Chautauqua parking lot? I've always wondered you know i don't know the exact spaces but it's not within just chautauqua it's on the streets yeah around the area yeah so inside the chautauqua um you know park and then on the streets so i don't know how much and it, 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 it protrudes into the neighborhoods yeah i was um, wondering when you said that thinking the 250 an hour if, if every spot was maxed out um you know what are those numbers yeah, and it increased by what a hundred or something. Did I remember that right? Yeah, a hundred, about a hundred visits a day on average. Yeah, I mean that's just surprising to me. Um, and then the other um, just observations that I I made is that you know like uh, and I'm just curious and I know you'll do analysis on this. Um, coal seam went down. Um, that's where we have a lot of bikers and I know you're counting bikers, um, but I think maybe people stay away from it because there's so many bikers. <laughs> maybe that's what's driving that number down. Um, and then Flatirons Vista, I don't know where your counter is, but if, if somebody does multiple laps, my daughter does a, a bike program there called Little Bellas during the summer and they, they cruise around there. Um, and so I don't know if they get counted twice. Yeah, I think I think where it is, there's a potential, depending on how big of a loop they make. We do locate most of our most of these counters as sort of proximate to the trailheads as possible, so that to minimize that looping. But it does it does occur in some places. Uh, we're seeing what we can do to sort of get information to calibrate for that. Colin, as long as there's a little silence there, staff could ask a follow-up question to Michelle. Uh, in regards to the interpretation of, of trail counts, I know that we've had instances of somebody just taking raw data and said, here's the number. And I know that our staff goes back and there's actually a lot of sh uh, sifting and an analysis that has to go into the raw numbers in order to then provide an ac what we view as an accurate count. Could you explain a little bit about um, what, what we look, what we look for to correct any an anomalies that may come out of raw, raw, pure raw data? Sure. There are a couple things that we do. Um, one to, because we do occasionally get quite high counts. Um, my favorite source of high counts is a herd of cattle that, that pop up in some of our various agricultural areas and post up near the trail counter, those tend to result in pretty high spikes. So we're able to look at what are the patterns, what are sort of the maximums that we typically see. And we've got some ways that we identify those data. It's pretty conservative. We try to really only filter out data that, data that we're really sure represent a, a pretty random event. Um, the other thing is that because of how we collect the data, we try and make it so that anybody who visits an open space property or area of the trail has to 
enter and leave past one of our trail counters somewhere, um, maybe not at the same time. So the simplest approach is to simply divide by two. You get a count going in, you get a count going out. That can get you pretty close. The newer equipment that we have that can do direction, we're able to, if some, if, if there's a particular spot where slightly higher percentage of people tend to go in at that spot and leave somewhere else, those give us slightly better corrections for that. So those are some of the layers that we add on. And that gets us to a visit, um, which is a little different than a visitor. So one person, if they visit every single day of the year, will be counted as 365 visits, or every day of the week, they'll be counted as seven visits. Um, the process of differentiating or going to that next little visitor involves a lot more layers, but that's the terminology that we tend to speak in. Um, I have a question. And if I didn't say it, thank you for the, the presentation. That was um, really informative and helpful. I know it, it wasn't just our city, it was kind of across the board. A lot of people felt like their budgets were going to be thrown through a loop from COVID and that just really didn't seem to be the case. As you were speaking, it reminded me and made me feel like it was the same thing that what I'm looking at wasn't really this great hike in visitation increase that we kind of said or expected during COVID when, when it um, was first starting and we were really worried about like, you know, the acute immediate traffic on the trail happening. Um, am I interpreting this wrong and, and it is there and I'm just not seeing it that way? Or is it kind of what I'm saying is that we thought the numbers would be very different from um, everyone being locked down in COVID. And when you look at it on this type of scale, it, it really wasn't that much? I think it's a little bit of both. Um, that definitely the, I mean, the overall visitation number, um, the fact that it didn't go up much was a pretty interesting result once we started getting it. It also speaks to sort of that, yes, it, it didn't explode in the way that a lot of people were necessarily describing it, but when we are seeing increases, this also gives some context to understand what those numbers are. And I don't think there's one size fits all in, in what those mean, but I think it's interesting when an increase of an average of 30 visits a day at one location might seem like quite a lot, whereas at another location, an increase of 30 visits a day may go unnoticed. And I think that's really that next level of question that we need to start thinking about and looking at is why does that experience sort of, uh, play out in different ways, even if uh, the overall numbers are maybe not as extreme as sort of what we thought they might be. Do you feel like your team in, in what I described in, in that last sentence that you just said, did, did they feel like when they were looking at the data that that was um, kind of confusing to them that it, it didn't, that there wasn't like a really um, visible spike. And then further, some of our other partners, Boulder County, I don't know if they're doing something similar. Did someone call them and say, we don't really see like this huge spike from COVID that we were very sure was happening. Is your data set showing the same type of thing or? Um... We're, well, we're, we're seeing a couple of different things. One is that even, even back in 2020 with the rather small sample of, of locations that we had trail counters at at the time, we were generally seeing higher increases at more of our outlying trailheads, the ones that had parking lots, the ones that were further out from the city center, um, possibly in a sort of just more similar overall context to some of uh, Boulder County's properties. I do know how they collect their statistics, so I think their statistics are pretty reliable. Um, it also suggests that there may be some differences between uh, the 
visitation base that was maybe attracted to their properties versus who is using a lot of our properties. Um, we do have a lot of locations that are really only accessible if you travel through the city center. Um, so they might have a little bit higher barrier to discovery than some of the larger properties and trailheads or distinct trailheads that Boulder County does. So I guess to answer your, your earlier question too, uh, when we were looking at the results coming off, we, we definitely took a look uh, at all of sort of the individual patterns that we were seeing for every location, which is one level of check that we do. Does, does this sort of this daily pattern make sense for the area that we're looking at? It was maybe a little bit of a surprise, although I was, I myself was just super curious to see what the counts were all going to start saying once we had close to 100 of them to really start looking at. And, and this is a bit of a sidebar, but the, the counters are, I'm assuming, like waist high. So there um, is no way that it counts pets, dogs that people take on the trail. Unless we, it's like a giant dog. Yeah, it, it, could, it could detect a, a giant dog. We do calibrations for all of our locations. So we do paired observation with our, with our equipment, um, both to adjust for things like people walking side by side and maybe only tripping the counter once. Uh, we do record number of dogs so that we can actually proportion those out. It's not very often, but there are a couple of sites, Dowdy Draws, or sorry, not Dowdy Draw, Dry Creek is one example where we may actually correct the overall count down slightly to represent number of people. Your, your counter is able to count the dogs as well? If, if they're large enough, yep. Oh, just if they're like, you know, Great Danes. Yeah, it depends. The, okay. the detection area gets wider. So if it's a pretty wide trail, it can sort of detect everything on the far side of the trail. If the dog, but it's waist high, so if okay. it passes right under it, probably won't yeah. count it. Yeah, that's what I assumed. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I had a question or two, Colin. Um, as I map this out sort of in my own uh, experience out there hiking, I certainly understand how our gateway trails um, would see large amounts of growth as pe perhaps people that used to be engaged in more indoor activities turn to the outside in a pandemic. I'm more confused about the trailheads that lost uh, usage. And so I had a couple questions there. It just it would seem surprising to me that the core usership of Boulder residents would be falling off during such a period or like other things coming to my mind, are you seeing in some of the locations that have extreme drop-offs, are these trails that are currently damaged, under construction, um, otherwise closed? Um, dig into the, what you're seeing in terms of those trails which are really falling off. That's the part I, I can't fully wrap my head around. Sure. Um, I haven't dug into every single one of these, but there are probably a couple that also cut your attention that got mine. One is uh, Bluebell there, uh, the Royal Arch Trail was closed a lot of 2021. So that could be one reason that not as much visitation was heading up that direction. Um, some of these other locations do represent areas where we've had management. There have been potentially some management changes. There's one, my cursor is here, sort of showing in the middle. This is a trail that it's actually a roadway that we have management responsibility for that is part of a commuter route that enters onto our trail system. So one possible explanation is lower commuting there. So probably there's different underlying explanations for some of these. I will say that pretty much all of these locations where we're collecting trail count data are close to or represent a paired collection with the visitor survey that we're doing, which includes questions about how people potentially modified their behaviors when visiting during COVID. So we have another data set that's being collected, which we might be able to look at for some and some explanations to some of those. It's also possible that when we go back and reassess some of these locations in a year or two, um, if 
for example, now that the Royal Arch Trail is open, we may see that that number sort of go back to previous measurements. So, thank you. Uh, could I jump in now, uh, Hal? Please do. Uh, thanks, Colin. Uh, that, that was very helpful and uh, actually insightful. I appreciate it. Uh, I have a, a comment, I guess, that, that will probably morph into a question. Um, I, I see the visitation uh, you know, studies and information as kind of foundational to uh, other management actions. And so my, my comment and question is, so for me, a primary focus for this information is a correlation between uh, resource impact, visitor conflict, uh, those kinds of things. So how are we using, you know, these data the, from the visitation studies uh, as informing uh, some of our other analyses, um, you know, that uh, we need for management actions? Yeah. Um, the short answer is, of course, that we, we haven't done those analyses yet, but I know this question is comes up quite frequently um, and it's a big part of what pushed us to take a step back and look at some of these new methodologies and start thinking how can we get better estimates at all of these locations so that we can start doing overlays of these data sets and see if when we see a pattern emerging in one data set, for example, undesignated trails, does that correlate at all with what we're seeing in terms of any of our visitation data? So we're not quite there yet, but that was one of the big reasons that we sort of took a step back and put the effort into redesigning or adopting this new methodology so that we can do that. So if we're not quite there yet, uh when when will we be there good question um i don't think i have a good enough pulse on all of our data to say that all i can really say is that we are we are having those conversations with the stewards of those other data sets and starting to uh to think about to talk about the ways that we could potentially overlay these data so, and some of those discussions as recently as a week ago, so. <laughs> well, again, again, I think this information is foundational to uh, many management decisions. And I, I guess I, and I'm sure other board members are hopeful that we can um, begin uh, integrating, you know, this information with, uh, you know, other uh, data sets or information uh, analyses that we're doing so that we can better inform uh, future management decisions. But I'm, I, it's much more sophisticated and, and far more comprehensive. Uh, I, I do want to give you uh, uh, some kudos um, than when we originally started uh, on it. And so uh, that is very uh, reassuring that we're, we're moving in the right direction. Thanks, yep. Glad, glad we can keep the momentum going forward. Karen. Um, on this slide 19 that's on the screen now, I'd like to ask you to just uh, look at a few specific spots. The, the very large blue dot that looks to me like it's um, somewhere around Chautauqua, what is that? Because it covers up a whole bunch of trailheads. That's on, that's on Bluebell. Um, so that's where our suspicion is that it, it's potentially related to the closure of Royal, Royal Arch for a lot of the year. Okay, and the, the trailhead that's at the Ranger Cottage is where? That is Enchanted Mesa. And can you point that out? Uh, it's, yeah, that's right up here. I don't or see. no, right there. Um, I don't see anything. Yeah, we're not we're not seeing your cursor. Oh, not seeing it. Yeah. Oh, there so you go. let's see. That's 
right here? Or are you talking about this other one? I was asking first about the that big blue dot that you're yeah. on now. And that you say is bluebell? It is. And then okay. Carol was wondering where the and where is the dot for the ranger cottage, the trail that starts from the ranger cottage? Oh, for the Chautauqua Trail? Yeah. Yeah, that's the red one here. And it looks very pale. What is that supposed to signify? So the, uh, the pale represents that uh, it's been a lower percentage change, but a large number. So this is, this is where some of this comes out to play. Chautauqua went up by 100 visits yeah, a day. Saw, we saw the bar graph that showed a huge growth. Yes, uh, but as a percentage, it represents right about a 10% increase, whereas for some of these other locations that are a bit darker red, it means that they, that percent increase compared to what it was in 2017 is higher. But the but the numbers of visits is 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 yeah low, the smaller the dot the lower the visit the darker the color the higher the percentage of growth right so this is this is maybe a good point of comparison this is Green Mountain Westridge it's a dark red because it was an increase of about a hundred percent going from around thirty five to eighty average daily visits. But it went from construction to completion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But that 35 is, is the reason the point is smaller is because it's much less than the 100 a day increase that Chautauqua saw. So, mm -hmm. and once this is, this this may go through a couple more evolutions. This is, this was really sort of even our first pass at finally being able to map out these changes in a way that we never had or we hadn't been able to before. And, and then just so I can get a sense of what this map is showing, um, I know there are entry points all along baseline there after to the west of the Ranger Cottage. So do you have each one of those mechanized? Many of those are going to receive short-term counts. They may not have all received short-term counts in 2021, but they will be in the first. We're going to start back up in April, so they will be over the next few months. And then we'll be able to get that comparison between 2017 and 2022 in this case. But when you when you uh put data monitors on them, you put data monitors on that whole collection of entry points along baseline, yes? Yes. Yeah, we rotate them in about blocks of 20 and they tend to all be geographically in the same area. Okay. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask about is during COVID, um, many open space departments, and I think OSMP did this as well, used the amount of uh, attention that garbage cans and outhouses needed as a proxy for visits. So with, with some people reported 30 to 40% increase in uh, the need to service garbage cans and outhouses. And yet you're saying that the number of visitors was pretty static. It depends on location, but the whole, the, the trash was also related to a significant change in behavior with a lot fewer people eating in establishments and taking food to go. So that was one reason that we think and, and other agencies I've talked to as well think that um, they probably saw some of those changes was because of changes in behavior of existing visitors to those locations. Colin, could you speak to a little bit of, of course, we're looking at 
annual estimates. And within COVID, of course, March 16th was a pretty significant day. Uh, I believe it was the 16th because we, I think we were all sent home from the office. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I know that those first five weeks or so uh, in March and early April was, was uh, you know, there, there were days where we were seeing summer like numbers out on the system. And, and, and I know that you're very careful as a data scientist to make sure that the language I'm using to describe things matches the data. So I'm gonna be careful here and you can <laughs> certainly correct me. But the first, you know, you know, the first few weeks in which uh, we were seeing at certain sites, certain summertime numbers, by the time we got later into the summer, we started to get back more into the routine pattern. And, and so I just wanna see, and, and this goes back to Caroline's question a little bit about what we were seeing in 2020. So I'm gonna use that, that English description and then you as a data science can come in and modify or correct that. No, I, that's, I mean, that's pretty much on point. We, we saw some peak visitation days within the sort of between March and May that four locations where we had past data that we could look at, mainly from the 2016, 2017 study that we didn't have an indication that we typically see at that time of year. So things certainly as, as we had had good weather days, uh, it appeared that many people were taking advantage of those opportunities earlier on that we hadn't had it seen in the past. And weekday visitation initially was also higher. It was it could be difficult to distinguish just looking at the data if you didn't have the dates a weekday from a weekend at some locations. After a few months we started seeing or after a couple months we started seeing the weekend weekday patterns start to reestablish themselves a little bit more at sites and then once we hit May, um, which was our peak visitation month, it was also Boulder County's peak visitation month. So our data lined up pretty nicely there. We started then seeing visitation days that were, had higher daily visits than what we had seen in the previous two months. So eventually, just this, it seems that the seasonal effect maybe overtook some of those initial uh, behavioral responses to the early pandemic. Can Karen, I, maybe some of the different demographics came out during that time. So we got more of the slobs. Colin, can you use your cursor to show what you just described verbally on the two maps, uh, the two uh, graphs that are on the screen now? Yeah, so we saw we saw Chautauqua here. Um, even though started going up a bit, uh, we never. The, I think these represent two different cases of responses that we probably saw to COVID. One is that travel was uh, quite a bit less in 2020. Uh, regional travel. We know that Chautauqua is one of one of the larger tourist destinations. That's probably one reason that it's gone back up. We'll know more once we have some of our survey data, but it's probably a pretty safe bet. Flatirons Vista uh, went up. It's these these are numbers slightly it, it remained higher average daily visits than what we had recorded as uh, several years before that. Um, but we did see those some of those numbers start to stabilize. I don't have all the all the plots up here, although they are actually available in the data explorer. Where we did see Marshall Mesa was one of them. We saw pretty high visitation numbers early on. Um, actually, our highest visitation day in the first half of 2020 occurred before the pandemic even started. It just happened to be a super nice weekend where. We got about a thousand visits in one day, um, and it took a few months, but eventually we started seeing the numbers on par with that later on in the year. Uh, 
I just had a quick little um, sidebar. You don't even have to go back to it if, if you know what I'm talking about. On the, the past slide um, where Karen had made some points, underneath the word boulder, there was a small red dot that looked like it was where the cemetery was. And, and if so, and there's a counter there, that's fine. I just want, um, the, all the other ones are trailheads or, or access points. Yeah. Um, and once we complete collections, you'll, you'll probably start seeing a few more points fill in in the middle here as well. So, and I didn't highlight this uh, right at the end. Uh, it's Maddie Dean um, is I think a, the, another level that we're going to want to start looking at this and I'm and this is what I'm working with others on is what are some meaningful or what are some other ways that we can categorize the different types of access points that these represent in terms of the amenities that they're accessing are they accessing a trail system are they accessing something else um, so that we can begin splitting out the statistics that we're reporting for those as well, because that could be one area where we begin to see differences in how visitation starts trending uh, over the years. Am I right that the little red dot underneath the boulder, is that where the cemetery is? Is that what the... Uh, let's see, boulder, right here. I don't see your cursor. We can't yeah. see your cursor. Oh, sorry. I've got two versions of this open. Yes, mm -hmm. that one. Yeah, what is that? Yes. That's where the cemetery is. Yes. And we have a trail oh. here for... Uh, I'd have to look. We have a... I mean, we've got a... We've got a broad expansion or definition of visitation. So basically any of our properties that are legally open to visitation and have a sign designated designated trail or undesignated trail of people accessing them we we typically monitor them is that at the, is the cemetery open space and mountain parks property uh i believe that might be the maddie dean site yeah uh i think it's near the cemetery i believe it's a five acre site yeah, and, I think that's right. I think it's Maddie Dean. And it is open space, Mount Parks. Why would we have a counter there instead of at the People's Crossing or? Well, we've only we've only completed collections at half of our locations. So this, all, this is only showing the locations that we completed counts at in 21. OK, and that's, I just wanted to make sure, um, like in, in really understanding the numbers, that if there are things like um, that that little dot that are being counted, but might not necessarily be either access point or trailhead as it's labeled. Yeah, I understand there's a lot of variables. I just wanted to, um, and, and did you say that there will be other counters at places similar to that where it's not necessarily an in, in, in entry into the trail system? Did I hear you say that or? Uh, yes, so okay. OSMP through various evolutions has, uh, has management responsibility on a lot of little sections here and there, um, properties here and there uh, throughout the city. So we do take all of those into account. Um, as I said, we've anywhere that people are legally allowed to access open space at the moment, we assess. The next thing to do on top of that is to begin potentially breaking these out into a few different categories so that we can begin describing different types of access um, individually. And it's quite possible that once we start doing that, we may see different patterns emerging in terms of how much visitation is increasing or decreasing within different categories or what that looks like on a year-to-year -year basis. So. Um, I'll, I'll just throw in for, for my part. Um, I hope at some point we can get uh, some counters out near the Cottonwood area, um, specifically the areas of Boulder that are under intense residential development. Um, I think it's really important we establish some baselines 
um, you, you know, these are the types of places that are really seeing a lot of growth. Um, so just being mindful that um, in some of those specific areas where we're building hundreds of new units, um, it would be great for us to be actively collecting data. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. I think that's a great point. Um, because of this new approach that we've taken, I guess if, if anybody was really digging into the past report, uh, you might see that we have about 40 additional locations that weren't, or 40 locations that weren't totaled up in the previous report. And part of that is that we're looking to do assessments everywhere if they fall below certain thresholds where we may or may not include them in certain estimates, we may uh, filter them out later. But because we know there are locations where even though it may only get an occasional a few visits a week right now, um, that could change in the future. So having a established baseline now is pretty important. Any other um, questions here for Colin, comments? I guess my um, kind of takeaway would be, you know, we collect data. And there's a lot of things that we can do with it. On the slide where we discuss some of the things to do with it, I, I thought that there would be um, more to um, the preservation of the heavy use trails as well as um, how we're using these numbers to help with maintenance, black backlog, that type of thing. So I guess really knowing beforehand um, of, of what we're trying to ask the data to do and then moving forward with it that way, you know, we all know it's great to have it and, and there's plenty of other applications for it. But I guess I just feel um, like maybe it's just so large for you guys right now that you're just still grabbing all of it and saying, okay, well, how are we going to use this? Um, but I would hope in that way, um, you know, there's a very good portion of it going towards, um, you know, prevention and, and maintenance and, and things like that. Yeah, and, and just to, you know, uh, I think Michelle alluded to it a little bit with the camp program up at Chautauqua. Um, so the overlay of certain data is, you know, we're doing parking study uh, data, which we're wrapping up of, of, of a phase two of, and overlaying it with trail count data, we could start to look at, um, you know, having really good firm baseline information. So if there comes a day where a sh uh, uh, the city uh, uh, wishes to participate in a shuttle to this Eldo State Park, for instance, we would be able to probably in a much more accurate way determine what the effects of that was by overlaying parking study data with trail visitation data in order to say, you know, what Michelle was kind of alluding to is the mystery of, huh, we have this new multimodal access, we've installed uh, uh, a disincentive in terms of monetary cost for parking there. Our parking hasn't changed in terms of the allotment so what's what what what's making up this data and so that that is one area when i'm looking at like dowdy and south mesa trail that overlaying various le levels of data we could maybe extrapolate better about the effects of multimodal transportation shuttle systems that sort of thing uh, by using different sets of data yeah my, my thought was like at, at some point you would try and come up with like each person for their daily visit depending on the trail you know would cost x amount of dollars to um either keep up if if the trail is labeled in good condition or what it would take to get it in good condition um and and using it that way and, and I'm, I'm sure you are i guess i just um expected just to see more of that on the slide Colin, yeah. thank you very much for a, a really interesting presentation. Clearly, the sophistication of our data collection is rising quickly. Um, we really appreciate uh, the, the, the dashboard. And thank you very much for spending some time with us tonight. Thanks for having me.
great to be able to share it with you. Thanks, Colin. And Colin will be back. <laughs> and the rest of the data is scrubbed and analyzed. Yeah. <laughs> so, Hal, um, it's 8.05, but I, I just probably have just a couple of minutes of verbal updates and then uh, we'll turn things over to you and you can make a call of where we're at with the meeting and, and how you want to proceed. Uh, but uh, a couple of verbal updates. Um, as some of you may know, um, uh, the uh, CDC is, has been changing a lot of uh, um, uh, protocols in terms of recommendations that are COVID related. Boulder County has followed suit over the past few weeks. Uh, with all of this and with the sort of uh, ebbing of COVID in general, uh, there's a lot of changes going on and that of course is affecting city as well. And so a couple of changes that are on the horizon is that uh, uh, we're expecting in the months of April uh, to begin a transition for those uh, staff that have been working primarily out of their homes to trans, uh, do some transitioning back into the offices and expecting for uh, that transition to take full, full steam in the month of May. So looking at April as a transition back in and then May uh, beginning our hybrid work of working um, uh, uh, um, a good part of our time uh, back into the offices uh, beginning in May. And how that translates into you all is that I have put on the agenda uh, for our, our April the discussion is to have a discussion of how this board wants to proceed uh, in terms of its cadence. Um, council is going to move into sort of the experimental stage uh, in April of moving to hybrid work uh, or meetings. And I believe April 4th may be their first meeting, but the first week of April in which we, we give it a go. And so uh, I think we'll collect information that we're hearing from citywide uh, over the next few weeks and bring it to you all to have a discussion under matters from the board of uh, where this board wants to move towards. I know in the past we've indicated a strong desire to get back in person. Uh, so things might not change uh, uh, from the sentiments of, of that, but uh, certainly an agenda item we should put on and uh, uh, put on the topic and see starting in May where we want to go in terms of working with you all and how we're going to interface. So just wanted to let you know that that's an April matters from the board uh, discussion. Um, a few other things, uh, just some of you may have followed the news that our Anemone Trail project uh, were, is completed and open uh, full time now. Uh, we've had have had some wonderful uh, responses back from the community members uh, about the trail, um, and of course we'll be doing a lot of monitoring over the next two years to determine the success of some of the undesignated trail closures and uh, what we're seeing with that uh, for the first couple of years in order to allow revegetation of the undesignated trails uh, that have been closed. It's uh, where uh, uh, people are asked to stay on trail uh, to support the uh, undesignated trail uh, restoration projects that we have going on up there. But if you haven't had a chance to visit there, highly recommend it. And uh, with that as well, just wanna uh, let everyone know, uh, we put some press releases out that the big loop on the Marshall Mesa area that connects with the county trail system uh, when there's not muddy trail closures in place is now officially back open. Uh, the Marshall Mesa Trailhead itself uh, uh, is remaining closed uh, due to significant fire damage and cleanup that is that is ongoing. So, um, just to, uh, with that, just a few updates for you, and that's what I have on my end. Thank you, Dan. Well, um, we are moving ahead of schedule. Appreciate you um, pointing that out and. Uh, you, you know, for the uh, heck of it, I think we should take a 10 minute break. How, do, how does that sound to people? Fully 10 minutes. I love it. Get yourself a, a, a refreshment, enjoy a, a moment of relaxation, and let's return here at 820.
Okay. Welcome back, everyone. Um, I see all of the board, with the exception of Michelle, who I'm sure will join us. Oh, there she is. Excellent. Well, Dan, um, I believe it's time for the matters from the board um, segment of the meeting. Um, slated to open for item A tonight, we have an update regarding the guidance for license and disposal requests involving open space lands. Um, by way of introduction, I think this is a somewhat special project, at least during my time on this board, in the sense that it has been a very uh, long and involved collaboration between the Open Space Board of Trustees and the staff to address a request that staff uh, originally had about updating um, some outdated documents and better clarifying um, the process through which the board will uh, review license and disposal requests. Um, we've uh, touched on this a number of times um, at various meetings. Uh, you may recall at our last meeting, we had a significant work, work session on the document and uh, I think at least made uh, significant progress. And basically we bring it back tonight with my hope that there's the possibility of uh, action or adoption if people uh, find it worthy. And I suggest as an approach, um, uh, given that it's fresh in everyone's mind, that um, we ask Leah to perhaps bring the document um, back up again once more um, for the board's review, staff input, and some uh, final collaborative work to see if we can arrive at something that we all feel really good about. Um, as we're putting it up, how, how you probably want the uh, uh, the one that shows the changes since the last meeting. Um, yes, that would be preferable. Thank you. Leah, are you able to retrieve that one? Yep, I was bringing up the the clean version. So let me grab the red line one and then I'll have it up in just a sec. Thank you so much. While that's being brought up, do any other board members have any comments they'd like to open with? It was nice to look at the red line version and see all the new improvements that we made. Great. I think we're making progress. Um, the, the one, the quick and easy comment I have is um, a couple of places I saw the word guidelines instead of guidance. And I'm wondering if uh, Leah could do a, whatever you call search and destroy. Sure <laughs> find and replace <laughs> for for guidelines versus guidance and just make those changes because i'm sure my eye didn't catch all of them and karen changing guidance to guidelines no the other way around guidelines to guidance right okay Let, let's do that and then as we review from the top down we'll see if for some reason that created any problems but that that sounds like a great starting place i do recall we all collectively agreed on that control h Anyone know offhand where it is in this version of words? The, the two that I uh, the two that I circled are in the third paragraph at the bottom of that first page. If if you hit Control F, it'll bring the screen up. Oh, that's impressive, Paul. Thank you. If you, you do Control H, it does the find and replace. Oh wow! Maybe it's, it's oh, all, right. all right. I'm a shortcut key person. <laughs> Oh, wow. Look at you. This is great. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so guidelines and is, guidance. Track, is track changes on so it'll yes. make this in red also. Good. Wow. wow. And in uh, the third paragraph down, you're going to have to change the language a little bit. It should be this guidance is meant to introduce in that case. <clears throat> yes. Um, I, I would recommend, I think we, we could run into a few problems um, down low. Let's, let's go from the top to the bottom and we'll address those sort of as, as we see them. Because um, I think there might be one other instance too. Um, so uh, I, I believe everybody is probably good at this point with our titling and uh, 
our uh, March uh, date. I do believe, um, far be it for me to predict anything happening, but we might be able to remove the word draft. That would be exciting. <laughs> Excellent. So um, let's just take it down uh, paragraph by paragraph. Perhaps it goes a little faster tonight than last time. Um, anybody with any final issues on paragraph one? And I need to figure out a way to see everyone and this document. So one moment here. There I go. Okay. Okay, I don't see anyone chomping at the bit on paragraph one. Paragraph two. I believe we agreed last time this is a, a, an, an excellent definition uh, paragraph. Okay, here in paragraph three, we have a couple changes. We just want to check went through correctly. This guidance, yep, is meant to use. Anybody with any issues there? All right. Um, section two, types of requests, definitions, paragraph one two of section two. Okay, next paragraph. Anybody with any uh, changes here? And if I'm moving too fast, please let it, please speak up. I want everybody to feel fully uh, transparent and informed. You're not, I'm waiting to get to the bottom. Um, I just wanted to see the foot, the footnote. Great. Um, I, I feel like I hit a tired and I'm like, am I saying something that we've already discussed? But I thought we had discussed um, maybe not having the footnote, but I, I guess we'll wait till we get down this. Let's see. Oh yeah, we got to eliminate guidance because we did eliminate the footnote. Yep, we'll re-delete that. <laughs> Okay, can we scroll just back up quickly, if you would? Thank you. So Dan, the footnote is out. Yes. Okay, I'm just losing my mind. I like got very tired and I'm like, should I have a coffee? <laughs> <laughs> Caroline, once all of those changes are accepted, that little one, all of that will go away. That that might have been confusing. Yeah, I mean, the, the red's typically a pretty good indicator, but apparently um, it just, I saw it, but it didn't register. <laughs> Okay. Down in the disposals section, section B. Um, I'd like us to just stop here um, and triangulate the bottom half of this paragraph to Dan's email memo and just uh, go out of my way to say, does anyone have any questions, concerns, desired clarifications in this area? Did, did you, did you have any thoughts? Um, yeah. Um, did I go? Maybe everyone's so, waiting for you to speak. I, yeah, you know, to be honest, I think, um, Bethany, uh, you, I feel like you've done a very nice job itemizing the various types of documents that are quasi conservation easements or their cousins and kin. Um, <laughs> let's, let's just take stock if we've, if we've, thought of absolutely all of them. Can we think of any other type of document uh, under which we protect land, um, which is not fee simple? And how before Bethany chimes in, we, we did use the word example. So if we did miss one, which we may have one okay, yep. type of contract or something out there that we didn't capture, 
we we are not saying this is the exhaustive list, but providing folks with the examples. So that that's one way if we forgot to catch something, but I certainly want to give Bethany the opportunity to chime in if she thinks there's other examples. And these are examples of disposals, right? Yes. yes. So I guess I'd maybe just ask one item of clarification. So um, obviously anything that uh, creates development rights is clearly defined here. Um, in certain instances, uh, perhaps in, in a conservation easement amendment uh, is seeking to be considered, which may not add development rights, but um, creates other somewhat substantive changes. And Bethany, will you just remind everybody what the, the fundamental process on such business is? Um, we do have a separate uh, board approved um, conservation easement amendment policy that, that discusses those things that wouldn't rise to the level of disposal. So um, clarification, clarification of language that doesn't um, impact prohibited or permitted uses, um, <clears throat> Scrivener's errors, where a legal description is wrong in the in the conservation easement, um, and and things like that. That um, and there are actually even two tiers within that policy where it's either a staff level thing, like to correct a, 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 a legal description, or where it does have to go to board, but perhaps is not considered disposal and doesn't have to go to council. Um, and so that's a that's a separate policy, separate again from this, which is uh, where. Basically, we have an open space interest in that conservation easement, you know, a, a, a defined conservation easement interest that we are get, somehow giving back or giving up something that was previously prohibited. Um, and that would rise to the level of a disposal. Is that helpful? It's, it's very helpful. I mean, it's tempting to think about whether some sort of a hyperlink or whatever would be sensible here. But in my opinion, because this document is going to be given by staff directly to a party for which it's appropriate that that seems extraneous to me um but i go to other board members for opinion how did you title it um bethany it was uh, the last two was easement policy what were the first uh it's actually titled the conservation easement amendment policy we um it's it's fairly applicable to to scenic easements, development rights agreements, things that are very similar to a conservation easement or treated similarly within the department and the city. Um, but it is it is titled the the OSPT conservation or OSMP conservation easement amendment policy that was adopted by OSPT. And Sorry, Hal, it, um, not the one that we started off with to to work on this document or or that one the 1995 that was an that? easement easement that was easement request policy which is somebody's requesting uh an easement onto our lands which is just one form of 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 an example here and so that's one of that's one of the triggers why we originally wanted to come to you is like we deal a lot more with just easement requests and so that's why we wanted to open up this discussion to capture all you know, all the requests that we get that relates to licenses and disposals. And presumably that's a somewhat- Caroline, it, it's that particular document that will sort of be superseded by this, the easement request policy. Yeah, and, and yes, it's terribly confusing. The easement request policy relates to things like access easements, utility easements, things like that, and not, it has no relation <laughs> whatsoever to conservation easements. But that document will still be in existence and still used, right? The conservation easement amendment? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And again, that really handles kind of an administrative, um, kind of the lower level that do not, do not rise to how, how those kinds of amendments to the document are handled that have uh, no impact on the, the open space interest really that, that is included in the conservation easement um, uh, documents. And so how those, those type of situations are handled. That's great. Thank you, Bethany. Um, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm feeling good and, and frankly, more learned on the topic than ever. So um, unless anybody else has anything else, we can go to section three.
This is our articulation of uh, hyperlinks to law. Um, we will just say, uh, we hope all the links work, and if they don't, we'll fix them. <laughs> There's got to be an app for that, right? <laughs> um, we did do, uh, down in the paragraph below, we did significant work together. Um, let's all just reread uh, quietly for a moment and, and agree that we liked our work, which was done late at night. Did you get feedback, Bethany, from CAO on in most situations? Oh, Bethany looks paused. She's thinking. Really thinking. Sorry about that. My internet froze briefly. Um, I did get uh, feedback, which is why you see in most situations. So there are situations where uh, uh, um, there are state state agency, state law that, that cannot be preempted by um, OSBT city council decisions. And so um, an example is uh, Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, uh, public uh, CDPHE, Colorado Department of Public Health. There are uh, certain regulations um, we could not preempt or, or, or waive some of their, or be more restrictive than some of their regulation. Um, and so we, we've, felt uh, or, or guidance was to put in most situations. Do you, do you have um, a list of exactly who or what agencies that applies to? Um, I don't, and I think it's really, it's, it really gets into the weeds of specific regulations, specific instances, things like that. Um, so for example, uh, if, if there was a, a mineral rights holder, a severed mineral estate under one of our properties, um, Colorado, the state state of Colorado legislation and, and Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission regulations would be superior to uh, Boulder County regulations, which would be superior to anything the city could do, even under home rule authority, really. And so um, if, if we were to say, you know, if, if they had mineral rights, we tried to negotiate a surface use agreement, but um, the, the state for whatever reason said, where you've negotiated to, for them to put their well pad is against our regulations, then theirs would override, theirs would preempt ours. Um, uh, personally, I guess I'm comfortable with this. Karen, you have a question? Yeah, I when I read this, um, the thing that came up for me is the city's wetlands and pesticides ordinances or regulations um, that were passed mm, 30, 40 years ago um, that are not mentioned here. And I'm wondering if they can be added as uh, parentheses, e.g., and noted as places where the city uh, has more restrictive uh, situations than other agencies? Is it like, if it's our law, then it, then I believe that it would need to be a hyperlink up underneath the definitions. Yeah, I think here it's saying outside regulatory approvals. So outside being the city. But I like the idea of putting in um, wetland and, and pesticide ordinance if there is one to reference in the document. There are. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. I think that if there are city ordinances that are potentially applicable, that they ought to be, you know, included as examples. I think previously, you know, what Dan said is that we can make a general statement uh, about, you know, city ordinances, applicable city ordinances, for example. Uh, which wouldn't be all inclusive necessarily, but would suggest that uh, staff in the the requester have to uh, pay attention to uh, other city ordinances. And it seems to me the easiest way to add that is in the last sentence, OSMP, OSBT, and our city council can, in most situations, be more restrictive than other permitting agencies, parentheses, 
EG, and then site are the city's wetlands um, and pesticide ordinances. I'm, I'm just, um, I'm fine with it being there, but I just think if it is there that the ordinance should be referenced under the um, list of definitions. If I was an applicant and I got this um, guideline sheet, I would want to be able to go down and look at those links and, you know, read up and do your due diligence. You're saying up at the top of the page where the other Boulder revised code and, and charter sections are mentioned? Yeah. How it yeah, be I don't the think that, that applies to the authority to uh, uh, of our guiding authority for licenses and, and disposals as far as oh, how mm -hmm. we approve or make them. Yeah, um, yeah. And I don't think our pesticide ordinance really applies to <laughs> how we would grant, grant a, a, a license or disposal. Um, yeah. Maybe wetlands, because yes, if they were impacting wetlands, they would need a, a wetland or, I mean, a wetland permit in some situations. But I think we're kind of expanding out of, yep. um, you know, into the kind of the project realm rather, than, you know, how a project might work rather than a disposal, actually granting and approving and considering a license at disposal. I'm not, I, I, I think. Yeah, we're... no, that, that makes a little sense. I, I retract okay. my, my suggestion, yes. Uh, well, well, I don't know if that meant we're retracting the language. It meant we're retracting the uh, view to move it higher on the page. Did I hear that correctly? Yes. Great. Um, wonderful. I will say, Caroline, from my perspective, if we wanted to hyperlink in this location down below, not, uh, you know, that could be a middle way. I don't know. Does anybody have a feeling about that? I'm happy with it either linked or unlinked, but it's more of a convenience thing. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, it would. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there is a hyperlink to the BRC up above, which would contain this okay we could we could double up that brc link and put it in the in, the, yeah. in that parentheses if we're going to do that should the should the ordinance to the number the ordinance number be there i don't know if we need to be that specific in this case because it's a convenience personally is if there's just a link to the uh, BRC on 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 these ordinances, that that strikes me as ample. Karen, you want to be the the decision maker on that? Yeah. With or without the number? I don't think you need the number. I think the generic reference to BRC is enough. Okay. Um. Wonderful. Making of a request. Okay, so now uh, this is where we all really need to tune in because this is where we we sort of left off with work that's coming back to us. Um, so we decided to list those things which are required in the first section, and uh, let's let's take those all in and raise any questions. Three lines before that, Hal. Um, okay. Leah, did you say that the footnote three would be automatically eliminated somehow or that you need to erase it now after administrative fee on what well, yeah once the track changes are removed anything that was deleted will go away okay okay can we um scroll so we can see the required items yep thank you Dave, how do you feel um, about the list of required items? Uh, I am fine with them. Anybody else uh, with issues or inclusions, suggestions? You're talking about just this first set of four bullets, right? Yeah, what we know every single applicant must provide. Yep. Okay. Just a question about that last one. 
Um, so the applicant should identify the regulatory agencies they believe have jurisdiction. Do, do applicants typically know that? I mean, know all the agencies that have juris, jurisdiction? Good question. I, I guess I would have no idea where to start. So, <laughs> to yeah, their so best you would, a, you would have a legal department you could go to. I was going to say, <laughs> yeah, typically they do. Or again, um, it would be part, you know, if, if they reached out, we would, we would be able to tell them they also have to seek things, but it would be required, you know, even to, to initiate the discussion. So, but very often they, they know who else they have to go through to, to, to make their to make their request happen. It serves as a great reminder. I think it's great. Yeah. Okay. And I really was time? trying to pull from the list below of things that would be required of anyone, and that is one of them. Yeah. Very nice work. Um, and without limitation, may include. And here is the laundry list. Uh, there's something wacky going on with the capital letters. Yep, we're mis we're mislettered on that. Um, it does correct when I'm looking at the clean copy, and it does correct. Okay, okay great. Yeah. <laughs> um, I want to uh, revert back to Dave here. You um, had some great thoughts in the last round. Have you had additional thoughts? Uh, no. I think I think they're good. Um, I do have some suggestions in the next section, but I do think uh, this one is fine. Uh, are you, you mean uh, segment A slash B, or like the whole next section of the document? The uh, section five of the document. Oh, okay, great. There's um, a little typo I'd like to point yeah. out. <laughs> under, under, yeah, there are some of those. Yeah, C or D map studies, surveys, and assessments. The first bullet should say at a scale requested by OSM. <laughs> Great, thank you. I'm good with the rest of it. I don't have any other comments either. Okay. Um, could we keep scrolling down? All right, let's just finish up the list in a read. Okay, I, I'm not seeing any, any uh, issues. Question, uh, segment five. Request consideration. Dave, you had a placeholder here. Yes. Uh, so I'm still uh, looking for some, you know, clarification of the board's role. So the consideration by the OSBT uh, in section, well, what I guess it's section A. Um, <laughs> yeah, it whether it's B, A yeah. or B, but anyway, consideration uh, by the OSBT. Um, I do like the fact that the last sentence, the last part of the last sentence was deleted because I think it was very confusing as to what was supposed to happen with the board's purported recommendation. However, I do think that it's worth saying something along the lines of uh, specific conditions and requirements can be included in the OSBT's motion on the disposal. So that uh, it's clear that when the information or request comes to the board, the board's action may include, you know, some specific requirements. Yeah, uh, Dave, I think we we didn't completely remove it. It was just a uh, redundant to area seven, I believe. And so that's why you guys had identified to to delete it here, but we can certainly add it back. Yeah, um, I think, you know, 
when the board, I guess, you know, just parochially, where the board's, uh, you know, role is being defined, I think it should be, you know, it should be included everything that the board is is supposed to be uh, dealing with. Sure, I'm, I'm fine with it. over done and see that's fine. Maybe yeah. we've done it, yeah, later, but I think, uh, you know, it should be here. So are you looking for a more nuanced treatment or simply bringing it back from the graveyard? Well, I, I'm, I think the language as I, what I uh, proposed uh, is clearer and should be included. Can you try it one more time so Leah can type? Yes, Leah, are you typing? She, uh, yes, I, I see her on screen too, yep. Okay, so specific conditions and requirements can be included in the OSBT's motion on the disposal. And this one's referring to both disposal and licenses at this point, Dave. And then it breaks it down uh, to the two right below it and the two bolt sub bullet points. So for yes. this one, so I, I have a suggestion then subsequently as well. Okay. Um, yeah, I would say include on the license or disposal. At, uh, just to again be all in okay, be fine. okay oh at the end osb yeah because at, at this section is referring to both yeah no that's that's a good point will you will you say that again sorry osbt motions on the license or disposal request yep perfect thank you So we, are we okay on that? I feel good, great about it, yep. Okay. Well then in, in the next bullet for disposal requests, um, I would actually suggest this language, um, which I think uh, follows or, you know, the charter language a little more closely than the, the language that we're seeing in the red line version. So, I'll just read it. For disposal requests, comma, OSBT approval of the disposal by an affirmative vote of at least three members of the OSBT is required prior to city council approval. Okay, let's, uh, we need to slow down um, our, 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 we'll, okay. we'll just read, read that same thing just a little slower, please. Okay, for disposal requests, OSBT approval of the disposal by an affirmative vote of at least three members of the OSBT is required prior to city council approval. Um, should we say consideration? Because city council may not approve. Oh, they, they, it could be a, a body that rejects it too. Uh, that's fine. Yeah, that's yeah. fine. Good. And um, I do need to add that your recommendation is also required under 175. So you have to recommend that city council approve and you have to approve. It's very specific and <laughs> very required. Not in, not in section 177. No. So yeah, that yeah. we have to meet both. That's why we always ask for your recommendation and your approval for disposals. It's one of those really quirky things because 175 requires you make a recommendation, 177 requires you approve. So that's, and that's because th this group on the screen was not involved in writing that. Writing the charter. Because <laughs> <laughs> we, we would have rectified it. Well, that's a good point. Th that was my concern is that recommendation was uh, from my perspective, uh, limiting, limiting the board's role. And so the charter says approval. And so if we want to go approval and recommendation, then I think that's fine. Right. And that's, I mean, it, it did say that it just used affirmative vote instead of approval. But yes, yes, we had the recommendation to council and a, a affirmative to try to, again, um, you know, uh, handle both of those those elements. Okay, and then uh, the the uh, last sentence would be: if OSBT does not approve the disposal request, the request is denied and will not be considered by City Council. 
So simply delete the. Uh, oh, okay, well now we can. I see. Yeah. Do we have to delete the part in the middle? Yeah. Then? Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. Leah, it should be will not be considered. Right. By city council. Yep. Thank you. Okay. So let's just read that closely, top to bottom. Do uh, you want me to do that? Uh, I, I, let, let's just do it independently. That's fine. Okay. All right. So very simple, very direct. That's great. Honey, can I just clarify that one thing? I, I I believe this is the this is true, but it has to be at least three members of OSBT, regardless of the number of people who happen to be on the board at the time. Or so, present at the meeting. Yep. Yeah. So let's say even if four people were present or four people were on the board, there would have to be at least three. God forbid there only be three people on the board for whatever reason. It would always have to be at least three. Yes. That is correct. That's okay. the way the charter is worded. That's right. That and the charter is not worded um, with improper grammar of less, <laughs> right? Right. Of no less than. I know. Yes. Right. I, it, right. Again, <laughs> there's been so many editors that uh, so many of us in this document. I, mean, I wanted to get rid of that. I wanted to get rid of that <laughs> language because I didn't want any uh, board member to feel lesser. Yeah. <laughs> Unless we're granting you a lease. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Bethany, I'm in say I'm in the charter. Yes. And you're saying that that in addition to 177, you're citing which other section? Uh 175. Oh goodness, you're gonna challenge me. Let me pull it up real fast. Um functions of the board, 175. Uh, A, shall make recommendations to council concerning any proposed disposal of open space lands pursuant to section 177 below. Got it, thank you very much. You're welcome. So that's all I had, Hal, if we're good. I think it's a uh, very clear and a nice update. Okay. Next paragraph. Uh, yeah, bring us in. What was the what? What's our resolution uh, from our discussion of timely manner? Um, yeah. So working with city attorney a little bit, um, timely manner is actually vastly or widely used around the city, and and pretty pretty applicable um, to, to these types of situations and, and the idea of operating in good faith. But I understand we wanted to kind of uh, expand on that a little bit. However, we also didn't wanna set actual days um, because that sets policy pretty much against ourselves as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so we thought, you know, both in the consideration of BioSBT, you know, the, what we had, um, what we had suggested and worked out language wise. And then um, Dan actually, and Dan and, and uh, city attorney and I worked together um, to come up with the, the city council. Again, we don't really get to, you know, force something onto the city council agenda um, or, or promise anything to a requester. And so it does have to go through council agenda committee to schedule things. And so we made, we made tried to make that clear in this update. And Dave, that was your um, concern. How do you feel? Uh, I think that's okay. Great. I just think, yeah, it clarifies the process to the extent that yeah. the applicant knows that, you know, there's a step that is in there that the agenda committee, you know, has to make a decision. Yep. So. I feel like it's a great res resolution there, yep. Okay, next paragraph. That, now that is, uh, as we say, beautiful charter language. <laughs> yep. Needing no further elaboration. Uh, six, approved requests. 
I have something on B, the disposals. Okay. Uh, I'm bothered by will be routed for signature. It seems to me it says, needs to say signature of. Or, or will be signed by. So just will be, how will be executed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, but we, we can't, uh, it could be a, a, any member of the city attorney's office. Is, is that fair or no? Or is um, conveying land office? interest is only by city manager. So you could say be routed for signature by the city manager. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's fine. I'm okay with it. As long as Bethany's, you know, 99% uh, positive, that's the pen involved. But if it's going to be routed for signature, it's the signature of the city manager, right? Not by. Oh, yes. Sorry. Of. <laughs> okay. Uh, for the signature of. Okay, I'm going to get into it too here, right? Okay. <laughs> the routing of it is not the final step. The routing is the step right before the signature. So, uh, how about will be signed by the city manager? Yeah, I mean, I don't think if we want to describe how we get it, to, the document to the city manager, that's fine. But <laughs> that yeah, that, really that works. Will be signed by the city manager. Yeah, yeah. I think that's perfect. <laughs> We were getting into the details of the process, right? There is a her designee, right? <laughs> and CAC doesn't have to schedule it either. <laughs> no. Our, all right. I see our routing procedures, Karen. Yeah, our routing procedure is quite <laughs> robust. So I wanted to give it <laughs> the credit due, man. <laughs> This looks great for me. I, I do feel like um, we might have an extra carriage return between the bullets and the two, but hey, you know, I far be it for me to get into grammatical changes. Um, anybody with content issues here? Does it matter, um, uh, like the way that we gave ourselves a loophole with the example earlier, using the word example? Um, for bullet point two, obtaining surveys, legal descriptions, satisfactory title reports, et cetera, in case there's something else, or I feel like all of my recommendations are normally to add something and get shot down like 50% of the time. So if mm -hmm. there's a reason to not add it, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that too. Um, I think we have uh, in, the, in the opening, uh, sentence there we have including but not limited to um, so I but again I could I could it would be fine to put etc or and similar due diligence documents or something like that if you want to put it in there oh as a last bullet uh, no to add on to the second bullet point I think Caroline was yep on the second uh, so if we say obtaining surveys legal descriptions satisfactory title reports and other document uh, due diligence documents. Well, we use the words due diligence. It might that might not mean much to a right. Yeah. Person, but I, I'm I'm I I see where you're going, Caroline. But I I am convinced that the but not but not limited to opens it up for each of the paragraphs, and therefore yeah. it's okay how it is. Basically, is my thought. Yeah, but, I just need someone to point that out to me because I like look at each one and I always like think about loopholes, but I, I think you're right, right that it's covered at the beginning. It's always buried somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's it. My, my trend is to just add, just, I'm just a <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that. <laughs> we we call that, it we have either lumpers or splitters <laughs> and you're a splitter. <laughs> Does a, I'm sorry, uh, I'm a subtractor. Um, does, <laughs> does the uh, comma after including need to be there? Uh, yes, because you say including but not limited to, is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah, that. Including comma but not limited to. 
Okay. Well, um, I, I, I'm, I'm going to open this up for final thoughts. I do want to just jump in and say um, this was a, a very long work document with excellent committee involvement by uh, OSMP staff, Caroline, myself, and to give a, a, a big thanks to Kurt Brown for all the work he also did on this. Um, I personally feel strongly enough about the work that I did in committee. I'd like the honor of lifting the motion if people feel they're ready for it, but I wanna give other people comments uh, in a moment to, to speak on this too, because I do think it rises to the level where if people want something to say, they should. I agree, and I think you should have the honor of making the motion. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll just say that this was my first assigned project when I came to the city of Boulder in 2016. So I share, I share Hal's excitement to bring this across the finish line because um, this was one of the first things I was handed out. And, hey, can you take this? <laughs> Not knowing what I was getting myself into, but- You still have it on your list. <laughs> Uh, and I also just want to thank Bethany, uh, who always impresses me with, well, her recital of knowing exactly where that clause language is in our charter. I mean, uh, the repository of information in Bethany's brain always amazes me. And so uh, what a great asset she's been to this effort as well. Yes, thank you, Bethany. I, I think it was um, a really cool document for everyone to get to work on because I think it really made a lot of us think outside of the box and um, the way we, you know, we're, we're viewing what needed to be in the document. Um, I think it was really a growth for all of us as a board to see um, what was necessary and, and what wasn't and um, giving ourselves the time to kind of move through all of that, so. Well done to everyone. Yeah, I mean, you all should be doing ultra marathons like John Potter here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if he's up to an ultra yet. I'll have to get an update from him. Well, he, how long has he been in the department? He's been doing ultras for a while. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 do you want to second the motion? Um, can I, I have one more word while John Potter's here on video. Um, I want to really thank both Bethany and John, who've spent an incredible am amount of time in committee on documents um, with this board. And really, this document to me um, reminds, I think, this board how important committee work is and how thoughtful we want to be when we assign board members to committees, how we interact with those people on committees, and how we function uh, in partnership with staff to get what we collectively think is a great result. And um, yeah, thank you, Bethany. Thank you, John, for all the time that you have spent in committee. And I'll take Karen up on her offer and I will uh, second the motion to approve. Before we vote, can we oh. have some discussion? Yeah, <laughs> sorry, doing we move way too fast. Please, Dave. So I concur with the appreciation that uh, everyone has expressed. Uh, it, it's certainly warranted, and, and thank you, thank you all for for participating. However, the concern I have about voting now, and I would suggest, I so my question is, can we legally vote on this now, or can we do a straw vote and put it on the agenda? It, for public comment. Uh, it just strikes me that something of this magnitude uh, would uh, certainly require uh, some public consideration. Well, I, I, I think that's a, 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 an interesting observation. <laughs> I'm gonna suggest the alternative in that this is fundamentally a uh, a, a staff requested document of guidance to applicants. It certainly does not constitute a disposal. And I really think that the document itself uh, goes out of its way to specifically hyperlink to the law and does not embellish nor influence the law in any material way. And so, um, I, I, I know where you're going with this, Dave, and, and I also will honor my own bias, which is to see this business closed while 
I am here. Um, and let's get other people's thoughts. Mm, it, it's an interesting thought. When I know that you um, made a comment that you guys have already had the attorney take a look at the document um, when you made the comment about regulatory agencies superseding each other. But the final, it was written that the final needs to go back to the attorney um, for, for approval. Is that, I see you shaking your head, yes, Beth. Yeah, they'll, uh, they'll review it just to make sure again that we're not uh, setting, you know, we're not doing something that it is against BRC or some sort of, you know, charter issue. It's really in that, in that realm. Um, and they've, and they've I been don't involved know in that. that. I, yeah, I don't know that I've ever um, encountered or, or uh, uh, heard of, you know, where public input would be requested again on kind of a staff level guidance sort of um, uh, document process, et cetera. Um, so, I'll leave but, that there. I don't know that that's but the, the attorney looked at this and we didn't make any major changes within the document. So right. we're all pretty clear that that this it hasn't changed enough where we would be iffy on that portion of approval. Correct. Yep. Yeah, there uh, there I, I don't anticipate any kind of legal changes. It, they would probably at this point do um, kind of formatting or, or outline changes to it, yeah, if anything. Well, and of course, if if they if they did, we like like I said, this is a we could view this as a fluid document. I mean, this is a guidance document, and if we learn through utilization of this that in August we want to add some, you know, we we can open it back up. It's 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 a pretty it's yeah. it's a document that's easily opened back up. And and so I guess our pledge to you as staff, if if CAO office has any concerns and wants us to make changes, we'll bring it back to you. And Dan, that what do you think about public comment? What, what would you? What do you think about public comment? I, well, I think it's gonna be hard for us to distinguish on those type of process management type of documents, which ones we decide we're gonna get public comment on and which ones we don't. I, 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 for one, kind of agree, I, I, I do agree with Bethany and Hal uh, pretty strongly, but uh, you know this is uh, uh, the board's discussion at this point. But uh, I, I see this as a process guidance document to make sure we're getting the information into applic requesters' hands and and how the board is expecting information to come to them. And um, so that's that, that's my opinion. So I will simply say that this board has been addressing this issue in one form or another for what at least four years, probably. And this is certainly one of the major outcomes uh, um, of the board's consideration, um, along with the resolution that we passed earlier um, a few months ago. Uh, it, so it just strikes me that you know, the, the community deserves to know that this is a major outcome of, you know, the attention that we have brought to, to the, to a particular issue, in, but that influences, that this influences certainly um, our, our approach to that. And I just think politically, we would be well advised to, uh, to have, uh, the opportunity for a public participation. But that doesn't negate a vote of, uh, when I term a straw vote of the board uh, at this point saying that, you know, we're, we're fine with uh, the work that we've done. And it's just to make sure that I understand, are you asking for, um, like at the next meeting for there to be a, a section for this decision to be made and then public comment to be made um, at the next meeting? Yes. Um, let's, all, let's all just keep in mind that there is a meeting schedule for the next meeting um, and uh, a full agenda. Um, I personally, from my side, Dave, I, I see where you're coming from. I don't intend to hold a straw vote um, because I think I know where it goes. For me, it's about whether we retain the business as opened or whether we close the business. Um, the middle ground is, is somewhat uninteresting to me. 
Um, but we haven't heard from Michelle yet, so I'd like to hear from Michelle. Yeah, I guess um, I would um, tend to agree with um, you, Hal, and, and Dan um, strongly that we should close this business out. Um, you know, I, I think that it's it's difficult to say, well, which which um, internal um, documents um, and procedures do we bring to public input, to public hearing? We, we didn't go through that process with um, the board procedures and, and ask the public for input there. Um, you know, we went through a process and I don't know if it was a form, I mean, adaptive management, we made some statements there. We didn't open that up. Um, so for public hearing. And so I think that we, we go down, a, you know, a, a path of, well, we're being, we're, we're opening up for, you know, these internal management documents that, that are really guiding staff. Are we going to do that for everyone? And then, you know, everyone that we, we work on. And then if so, we, we've got to accept that. And, or, or where do we draw that line? We are not doing disposals here. We are saying here are the guy, here are the here's the guidance, not guidelines, the guidance for disposal. And it's the yeah, the guidance for the well, yeah, something like that. Yeah. Um, uh, truthfully, and, and with all due respect uh, for Dan and Bethany, obviously I take the staff, staff's input very seriously, but it is at the final uh, discretion of the board. So um, I think what we need is for people to indicate whether they believe I should, uh, you know, put forward a vote or not. Um, so let's find out where people stand. Um, is it that? Uh, sorry, I just have um, one more question. I think I think one more question for Dave. Is it like the final outcome of of what you want with the public hearing? Is are there many aspects to it, or? is like the broad stroke, um, you know, it's a, a taxpayer funded source, OSBT is unique to disposals, it's a disposal document, and I just want to give them um, a voice to be heard if they have anything to say, or, or is that too broad and there's more specifics? Yeah, I, I just think um, today uh, the issue of disposal, um, it, it, it's very unclear to the community. The issue of disposal of open space is very unclear to the community. And this is an opportunity for us to afford the community uh, a chance to better understand what the role of, or the process of disposal is. And uh, I, I think it's, uh, obviously been very controversial in the past several years and will be in the future and it just strikes me that we ought to take every opportunity we have to make sure that there's no misunderstanding or or misinformation or misinterpretation of um, what the role of the open space and mountain parks department is along with the open space board of trustees so this is just an opportunity for, you know, to make sure, at this point to make sure the community knows that we've developed this policy and here's what that means as far as disposal of open space land. Dave, um, I, what, what Dave, I, I want to correct that it isn't a policy. <laughs> um, it's guidance and and also, you know, just to just to kind of touch on a few things you guys have said. Um, and and again, I, I, Hal is right. I, I obviously, I mean, in the sense that this this is a, a, the action by the board is is your purview and your decision tonight. The public doesn't have a role in disposals other than obviously the the public petition period under the charter. And so, um, but they have had the opportunity. All of these meetings where this has been, you know, we've had now five meetings. I think where we've attached this this document as a written memo or some sort of. Um, of uh, some sort of memo to the agenda and there is open public comment. So there has been the opportunity to review and comment on this as part of part of open comments. Um, and, and so again, I'm looking at this as, you know, a, a request to really just document the guidance of, of how requests can be made and how they are put through board and council. This is not a way or a, in any way, um, 
a, 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 a you know pulling back that that the public can comment on individual license and disposal requests at any given meeting, or or things like that. So again, this isn't this isn't setting policy, and um, you know I think I think the opportunity to educate through this document has has been in several <laughs> um, board packets. And so I guess I'm looking to, is the, is the purpose to put this in front of a public hearing that the public would have input to edit and change this document um, that, is, that is staff level guidance? Um, I guess that's my question. I'll mention from my side, I do think um, that we have gone to an unusual level of transparency with this, publishing both closed uh, finished uh, drafts as well as redline drafts. I believe now, in if I count correctly, five instances um, over multiple boards. Um, and so to that end, uh, I feel very good about the transparency on the project. So all I will say is that uh, it, it's a cautionary tale. Uh, it just feels to me like it's an insider internal deal. And yes, we, we have tried to bend over backwards as far as the public participation, but uh, I think that the, the, the community at large uh, really has not understood exactly uh, what we're proposing. Karen. I hear what Dave's saying about the need for the public to understand the process of disposal beyond the two or three sentences in the charter. And I'm wondering if the motion could uh, contain an additional phrase that says, and publish the final version in the, uh, along with the, uh, what is it, April? Yeah. Mm -hmm. April 13th OSBT agenda and um, encourage public comments during the open comment period. Yeah, could we even take that a step further? Dave, I wonder if this would make you feel any better. At, at this point in time, could we designate a couple of board members to write a, an, a, a letter to the editor and- Ooh, That's a great idea. And talk about how we pass this and hey, take a look at it. it this, this work spans six years and we, um, and if you do have feedback, do let us know, but this is what we passed at this last board meeting, check it out. I think that's a great idea. I fully uh, subscribe to that. I, I do as well. Uh, so thank you, Michelle, for that. I think that's an excellent idea. Having said that, uh, I think uh, if we, part of this action is that we officially appoint uh, two board members to do that, given uh, some of our recent experience, uh, that would be most helpful. Um, I'm, I'm happy to do it. I'm happy to step aside. Um, and let someone do it if you guys think it's appropriate for a committee member to do it um, or have two other board members, um, I'm fine either way. I guess my recommendation uh, following up Michelle's suggestion is that uh, the two board members that served on the committee uh, should actually be the authors of the uh, commentary or opinion piece. Hmm. I, I, I think that's a, a good point. I see another side of it too, which is if we are unanimous that we've done excellent work, that lending um, perhaps Karen and Michelle um, to this would, would really signal that to the community. And that would be fine as far as I'm concerned too. I'll just admit that I'm gonna be out of pocket for the um, a good part, like three weeks of the next four weeks. Um, if you guys would like me to, I can um, designate myself tonight and send out an email to everyone and, and see the interest or, I mean, I understand why we would pick tonight and just call it if we're going to do that. Um, but it sounds like Michelle would be a, a little more out of the running. Is that fair to say, Michelle? Yeah, I think so. Okay. So then um, down to four. Karen, do you have any um, interest or are you happy to see someone else do it? 
I won't know till I see my surgeon tomorrow. Okay. Oh, well, then do that. Do you do you want us to give this 24 hours? Um, if, if you all would like, uh, be, because I, as staff, I can inter, inter, uh, interface with all of you at the same time. And you have some limitations in doing that. If, if Hal and Caroline want to draft something up, I could set my eyes on it too. I, I, I have no interest in drafting something up. I've put my heart and soul on this over three years, an yep. incredible amount of my time and effort. And being that it's an internal staff document, I, uh, I, I'm okay. happy to let my work stand on its own two feet. Okay, so then. It's, I, 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 and, and, and I say that with the utmost respect, it's just that volunteering ideas, which then create work for other people, has become a little bit commonplace uh, at times. And I think what we should really strive for as a board is when we have ideas, be willing to back it up with our own work and effort. Um, yeah, I still I still think it's a, a good idea. So if if that's being said, then then it does get easier because now we're down to three. So <laughs> if two people are doing it. Um, oh, I'll, I'll say I'm not convinced it's necessary, but um, I, I do. Uh, of course, if others like the idea, I support it wholeheartedly. Well, maybe we should s sort through, uh, you know, kind of where, where we're at and, uh, and get the decision made on whatever it needs to be made on. Okay, well, I'll, I'll start for my, myself. Um, this is a guidance document that staff intends to deliver to applicants to help them understand the process of working with this board. I also have seen it as becoming very useful to educate board members themselves. Certainly, I think we would all have to admit we've been educated um, through this process and um, that the law stands on its own two feet and we're unwise to attempt to interpret the law for future boards. Um, whoever the five individuals that sit will ultimately be the deciders of various disposal issues. What we have done with this document is uh, give staff what they requested to us, which is a framework to get equal and consistent information from every applicant. And it's as simple as that. Um, I, I, uh, and so from that standpoint, um, I guess, I guess to, frankly, I'm a little surprised to hear about this this late in the game. It would have been helpful um, certainly in our pl planning process, if people had brought this to the fore earlier as opposed to the 11th hour. Um, but that being said, um, uh, as you guys know, I will not be with you at your next meeting. Um, and with that, I, I want to offer my opinion and step back because it will become your work. Um, I will not be here. I guess in response, how, um, you know, the, the 11th hour is always better than the 12th. Um, so uh, I, I don't have any problem with that. The, so my feeling is, is that we, we should take a vote on whether in fact we want to do anything uh, before we vote. Wonderful. Pass would... this uh, proposal, this draft. Great, I think we've got two opposing votes on the table to start. Dave is in one camp, I'm in another. And um, we can, we, other people can display what, if they'd like to keep it open, renegotiate the April meeting, um, add a public hearing, et cetera. Um, they, can, they can sign up for that now. So we have a motion on the floor that's been seconded. Don't we first need to vote on this? Yeah, or the, or the motion needs to be rescinded. I'll call for the question. Uh, what does that mean, sorry? It means that you have like, to ask for a vote on the motion. Okay. I would like to rescind and start over with the motion. And, and while that's happening, I'll say why. Um, I have already seconded the motion before Dave gave his input. Um, and I always try and think of myself as serving on the board as doing this for the community. And I hear one board member stating that they would like it wrapped up. And I hear another board member stating that they would like it extended, what I believe is equivalent to 30 days. Um, 
I guess for me, when you think about like the big picture and what is on everyone's mind, if there is concern over backlash or, or the public feeling left out in some way, I, I wholeheartedly agree with Bethany that, you know, all of this has been in, in packets and done in multiple meetings. Um, but in hearing the request from two different board members and erring on the side of, of the charter, asking me to really be, um, you know, a public community service member, I, I feel like I will um, support Dave and his request and we'll just see how it goes from there. So that's two people in support. Karen, where, uh, where do you fall on all this? I personally am ready to vote on the motion and then I'm ready to to have a decision by the board about whether we want to have a, an op-ed submitted to the paper. Okay, so we've got two and two. Michelle? Yes, I, I'm ready to vote on it. Um, and just one other comment that um, Hal has three years of information on, on this particular to topic and, and project. Asking a new board member to vote on this uh, um, at his first meeting for something that has spanned six years, I don't think is really fair. And we are not leveraging the knowledge that Hal has acquired during that time. I don't think that's fair to our new board member and I, I don't think it's fair to Hal. Yeah. Um, I think the community has been in, invited to participate in this all along. And, um, you know, as uh, an, an additional gesture, having uh, a letter to or an op-ed published about this, I think meets largely what you're, you're trying to accomplish, Dave. Thank you, Michelle. Um, so that's three people who are ready to vote. I, I just want to comment within it. It is not my style and never has been to try to leverage anyone into doing anything. Building consensus on this board has always been the focus. And at it, when we're doing our best work, we tend to work unanimously. Um, I have always just focused on the merits of the work, believing that if great work is done, it speaks for itself. Um, and so within that, um, it's unfortunate to me that we're divided. The big lesson that I would uh, communicate from my side as the current chair is that if people do feel that a public hearing, which is not required by law, should be implemented by the board, that it would be great to prepare the chair and the, the director of the department um, for that. It strikes me as a little bit inconsiderate to essentially upend the schedule that has been put in place for the next meeting and or extend um, something like that. Uh, I'll leave that piece there. And um, essentially, uh, I am ready to, you know, this is my uh, motion on the floor. We have a second from Caroline and am ready to uh, take this for a vote. Caroline withdrew her second. I think we're gonna need a fresh second. I'll okay. second. Michelle is, sec thank you, Michelle. That's perfect, I appreciate that. Um, so I have the motion, Michelle has the second, and we are ready to call the roll. So as far as uh, reading the motion, what, uh, how, how should we function on that? I, I really think this is an acceptance that the yep. board is accepting the uh, uh, guidance and, uh, uh, to be used. You know, somewhere along that, uh, the board is accepting this document of some sort. Okay, Leah, if you could just um, pull up a, a Microsoft Word. We've got um, Hal on the motion, Michelle on the second, and the motion um, she'll read, uh, you know, Hal, Hal moves that the Open Space Board of Trustees accept and approve the license and disposal guidelines document as amended. Not guidelines, guidance. Okay. Guidance, <laughs> guidance, <laughs> guidance uh, document as amended. Okay, and with that, we'll call the roll. Um, uh, voting first, Caroline Miller. Sorry, I couldn't hit my button. No. 
Okay, Dave Coots. Yes. Karen Hallway. Yes. Uh, we have it passed on four affirmative votes with Caroline dissenting. And uh, in keeping with how, how we agreed to keep our, amend, our minutes, Caroline, would you like to provide a phrase or a sentence that says why you are voting no? Uh, yes, but to not hold us up um, because my brain is moving slow. I, I wasn't expecting us to, to have um, this happen. If, can we go to the second and come back and I can add something that sounds better than what would come out of my mouth right now? I would like to make a motion that um, the board approve um, one or two authors to write and submit to the daily camera an op-ed to educate the public about the, our guidance for disposal requests. So Karen has a motion on the floor. I'll second that. Michelle seconded. Um, we will then uh, move to a vote. So starting there, um, Caroline Miller, how do you vote? Yes. Dave Coots. Yes. Um, and I will also vote affirmatively, and that is unanimous business. Karen, I think that I, I might have mixed up your words. Will you read what I have and? Uh, approve one or two authors to write and submit to the Daily Camera an op-ed uh, to educate the public on um, the guidance regarding a a request a disposal request. You guys might um, be super annoyed with me by the end of this meeting, but um, I might shift my vote from no because if you're writing that, that would be the reason for the no was just to allow the public to have more um, input or guidance on the document. Okay. I so am I, can I switch without us having to redo everything? Do we have to start over if I switch again? I think what we should do is uh, rerun the, the, the role on motion number one. So we'll start from the top. Uh, that was my motion with Michelle seconding. And we will um, run the roll call again on that, starting with Caroline Miller. Yes. Dave Koontz. Yes. And Karen Holwig. Yes. That's wonderful. We have unanimous business on a, a long worked uh, project. I really appreciate that, Caroline. Did, did um, we pass the second motion? Yes, we did. It, we unanimously. Okay. So uh, who seconded the second motion? Michelle. Uh, Michelle. Well, okay. <clears throat> Wonderful. Um, one, one thing I'll just mention within that is uh, if perhaps the daily camera would circulate the document itself, um, that could be an amazing thing um, because I really think the document says most clearly exactly what it is um, that we've done, something to consider for whoever it is um, that ends up writing on the subject. Um, okay, that's uh, really great. We've got closed business on that matters. Um, I want to raise one more item before we go on to um, discussing my departure, uh, which is uh, I spoke, um, well, well, I should say the board has consistently looked and thought about the underground water issues um, related to the flood wall and CU South uh, on numerous occasions. And I talked to board members on the topic. And basically, I just want to arrive, um, if possible, in discussion at a little clarity on where we think this board has left our um, the current status of our resolution and or the uh, memos, uh, Karen, discussed on water issues. Do we basically as a board feel that we have uh, touched on those issues adequately?
Oh my gosh, I could not hit the button. I'm sorry, how, um, the, the question, can you just reword the, the question about? Um, basically, we, um, we, we I, I guess we, I, I'll put it this way. This board over many years um, developed a variety of motions related to CU South. We actually created a document which cataloged those motions. And there's, there was discussion at various points about underground water flow at CU South. And I just frankly am a little bit confused myself about where we have left it off and if everybody is satisfied where it's left for the time being. I would say I feel too um, tired to make a decision about that. I, I feel like I would need to. I, 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 I'm not proposing a decision. I'm just, I'm just wondering what people's understanding is about what, what, where we've commented and how. Okay. Well, it was really just a question for me. And if, if people have no comments on it, um, th that's wonderful for the, the next board to consider. Do you feel, uh, was there something you wanted to say about no, it? No, no, I, I feel unclear on where we, we've left off is, is why I'm raising the question. Um, I, I think we've been clear several times about what it is we're focused on uh, in terms of the groundwater conveyance system and the expectations for it. And the... Uh, and, and, you, and, and that clarity came from where you feel? From the board's previous resolutions and motions and discussions. Okay. And Hal, I also think that there are at least two state agencies who are responsible for permitting um, water issues um, and the state engineer's office, for example, uh, will certainly weigh in on the groundwater uh, situation and the Colorado Water Conservation Board is responsible for in-stream flows. And so if there's any um, uh, diminution of downstream flows, uh, either for water um, rights or for in-stream flows, um, those agencies have the responsibility to um, deal with that. That's that's really helpful. So so there's there's outside permitting, and then additionally, um, this board has provided some clarity through the resolution on the desire to see underground water flow, not just in-stream flow, but underground water flow uh, maintained um, for the preservation of the downstream area. That's great. It was re really just kind of clear, frankly, just clarifying of what we collectively know as a board. So thank you for that. Great. And that brings me um, to the final item, which is essentially the fact that um, this is my last evening with you all. And it's and... my turn. <laughs> Please. <laughs> uh, I would write, like to read a proclamation recognizing the dedication and volunteer service of Hal Halstein to Boulder's open space and mountain parks from 2019 to 2022. Hal Halstein joined and joined the Open Space Board of Trustees in 2019. He brought his interest and experience in land conservation to Open Space Board discussions on funding land manage and land management in order to balance the protection of fragile natural areas and provide valuable recreational opportunities. Through the last year, Hal has chaired the board showing immense passion and leadership along with a clear commitment to this community. During his time as chair of the Open Space Board of Trustees, Hal, Hal handled, handled the considerable challenge of leading virtual public meetings with composure, grace, and professionalism, and highlighted his New England roots, showing fairness in discourse and dedication in getting things done. 
Hal helped lead the board through robust discussions and actions with regards to the, C, to the South Boulder Creek flood mitigation project and CU South annexation. Becoming in the process very knowledgeable on the range of issues from the flow dynamics of a flooding creek to the population ecology of the Ute Ladies Tresses orchids. He helped support and contribute to department management decisions with regards to nighttime parking hours along Flagstaff, to addressing the challenges posed by the spread of invasive New Zealand mud snails in our creeks, to updating the guidelines for assignment of agricultural properties to to prospective tenants. Hal has provided invaluable feedback and leadership on the complex project to restore irrigated agricultural fields in the northern part of the system and enhance prairie dog populations on the southern part of the system. Hal was involved in numerous planning projects, including a recommendation to council on changes to alcohol possession for open on open space lands in the Boulder Revised Co Code uh, a, a Boulder Valley Comp Plan Blue Line Amendment, as well as supporting the first bilingual equity sign project at Sawhill Ponds. In addition, Hal was supportive of the Wonderland Lake ISP final recommendation and the recommendation to the city manager on the Wonderland Lake name change. During Hal's term on the board, the following were fledged on OSMP lands. 21 peregrine falcons, 20 osprey, 11 burrowing owls, nine bald eagles, five prairie falcons, and three golden eagles. Additionally, Hal contributed rough, roughly 483 volunteer hours while serving on the Board of Trustees. He has helped preserve over 200 acres of open space land, including acquisition of the Shanahan Ranch and the Longs Gardens Conservation, conservation Easement. He has participated in review and approval of several complicated land exchanges and disposals, allowing for even better management and stewardship of our open space lands, and has championed the guidance for considering license and disposal requests. Therefore, I, Karen Holweg, Vice Chair of the Open Space Board of Trustees, do hereby proclaim, proclaim that the leadership exhi exhibited by Hal Halsting over the past three years has been instrumental to the success of this board and the Open Space and Mountain Parks Department. Proclaim this ninth day of March in the year 2022 on behalf of the Open Space Board of Tr Trustees and the, and the Open Space and Mountain Parks Department. Wow. Wow. If, thank you. If that isn't the kindest thing ever said about me, I, yeah, well, I know it is. Um, <laughs> I, I deeply appreciate that. Um, I think you all know for me personally, um, serving this board is frankly the greatest honor of my life. Uh, there's nothing that I care more about than this community and, and our commitment to preservation. Um, it's what brought me here. Um, well, we'll hope to con continue seeing you then, right? Yeah, uh, you, ho hopefully you'll see me around on the trails with more time on my hands, hopefully. Um, and, and I do just want to uh, go out of my way to say, um, particularly the relationships formed with staff, the opportunities to get to know other community members through collaborative work has been uh, incredibly special to me. I know I uh, don't always do the best job um, at it, um, but I try hard and uh, I learned so much from each of you. And really the the most precious moments for me have been the staff led field trips the greatest part of serving this board is the opportunity to learn about this system at a level that you just cannot learn in any other way than with some of these highly educated uh experts that we're so fortunate to have working on this department so um dan john bethany you know mark i, I could go on and on um Burden, I see you back there, Brian. Uh, every person that I've gotten to interact with, I'm so impressed with the professionalism, the intelligence, and the dedication. Um, it was wonderful being with you. Yeah. Well, likewise, Hal. I, you know, I, 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 I hope to have grabbed you on the phone today, but had to leave you a long message with my dog barking and 
in the background, but uh, um, just to let everyone else know what I conveyed to Hal is, 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 is very similar sentiments to what he's conveying at this point is just what it's been a, a pleasure for me to have gotten to know you and, and, and to have, you know, gone through the ups and downs of what it takes to, to, to chair an, uh, any board. I mean, it's just, it, it's a lot of work and it's a lot of, it, it, it may not be always the time that goes into it, but I know that there's a lot of thinking in between the meetings that you're doing, going into a meeting and that's stuff that's probably not even captured in these volunteer hours that uh, of what's going on in between your ears in terms of the responsibility of being a chair and wanting to be good at it. I, I know you enough to know that you take a lot of pride in wanting to do something well done. And I can honestly say that you have done that the past year. You have, in, in this virtual environment and everything else, you've, you've risen above it and I think you've done a, a marvelous job in shepherding all of us and and uh, and and really putting some some structure to the meetings that is needed. And so hats off to you and thank you so much for all your leadership. Well, maybe you guys, when you get back in person, I can make a guest appearance for dinner one time. I promise to disappear well before the meeting gavels in. <laughs> <laughs> you need you need to at least have your choice of dessert, which you missed out to, on tonight. Well, thank yes. thank you all. Yeah. I, uh, Thanks, Al, and good luck. Uh, appreciate uh, this past year, and uh, wish you well. Yeah. Thanks. To you all too. Wonderful, everyone. Um, I look forward to tuning in and seeing you all in the future, and uh, also uh, hopefully some of you in the tribal council coming up. Um, it is now 9.52, and I believe we are adjourned tonight. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thanks, Hal. Good night.